like to call this meeting to order. <laughs> Welcome to the Zoning Committee of the Charlotte City Council on January 17th, 2023. Um, we'll start this meeting as, as we do all meetings uh, with introductions uh, from the dais. And we'll start to my right with the Deputy City Clerk. Billy Tons, Deputy City Clerk. <clears throat> Happy Tuesday, Dimple Ashmer at large. Hello, I'm Marjorie Molina, District 5. Good evening, everyone. James Mitchell at large. Renee Johnson, District 4. Good evening, Luana Mayfield at large. Liz Babson, Assistant City Manager. Braxton Winston, Mayor Pro Tem. Malcolm Graham, District 2. Tark Bakari, District 6, and a happy birthday to the Mayor Pro Tem. <laughs> Yay! Happy birthday! <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> Dante Anderson, District 1. Good evening. I'm Victoria Watlington, your city council member representing District 3. Terry Hagler Gray, Senior Assistant City Attorney. Thank you very much. Um, up next, we will uh, move on to our invocation, which will be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, we begin our meetings with an invocation, which is an expression and inspiration um, by a Charlotte City Council member. It is intended to solemnize our proceedings um, and in recognizing that we celebrate the religious diversity of our community, including those without a religious faith. Tonight, uh, Council Member Johnson will give our invocation. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. In honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I just want to share a quote before I start the prayer. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in his moment of comfort and convenience but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. Bow your heads. Dear Lord, thank you for the honor and the privilege of serving this city and your people. Please let us, as leaders, humbly remember that we are called by you to serve unselfishly. On this first zoning meeting of 2023, please help us to lead and grow this city responsibly and equitably, keeping in mind those who are being displaced, who are homeless, and who are hurting. Help us to find solutions. Please guide us through the challenges of leading our changing city, remembering that whatever we do for the least of our brothers, that we do unto you. Bless this meeting and bless your people. Amen. Amen. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> um, before uh, I get into an explanation of the zoning process, there are a couple pieces of business I just wanted to kind of go over with, with the council. Um, uh, council members, uh, we will have conversation. We won't decide this at the dais, but there is an ongoing conversation about the location of our retreat. Um, um, and uh, I just want us to be aware that we'll be receiving some phone calls over this next 24 hours. Um, so we need to give staff a final kind of recommendation of what our desires are. Okay. okay. Um, on your, um, on item number 25, there is no longer a speaker against. Uh, so that petition um, uh, will we'll only have three minutes. And uh, finally, I would uh, like to recognize Ms. Mayfield, who asked um, to be recognized um, prior to this meeting. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem and colleagues. As everyone knows, this past weekend, we kicked off a number of celebrations throughout our city in the remembrance of the service and the work of Dr. King, not forgetting that that work was focused on union workers, on low page workers, on access to housing. We had a, a number of amazing programs, including Growing the Dream. So I would like to thank Terry Bradley and all of the staff of Charlotte Mecklenburg Community Relations Committee. Although we did not have a parade, we did have a march that had a wonderful attendance. But I also want to acknowledge and thank Federico Rios, who is our Assistant Director, Office of Equity, Mobility, and Immigrant Integration. Some may and some may not know that we have a growing Sudanese community. So our neighbors from Sudan 
on Saturday had a chance to come together, the first in our city, so it will be their first annual, celebrating 67 years of Sudan's independence. We have a growing refugee community, and I want to thank Mr. Rios and his small but mighty team of only three people, I believe, possibly four, for recognizing the outreach and the support. We have a number of festivals coming up throughout our city, so please take the time to check the calendar, stay engaged, to learn of our international community that's growing and go out and celebrate. It was an absolutely beautiful event, and I had a chance to meet one of the sisters again on yesterday morning for the YMCA's growing Prayer Breakfast, which is also an annual event who works at our convention center. So we are, have been designated as a welcoming city. I am thankful for that, and I hope we continue to be that. But for my Sudanese brothers and sisters who I met on Saturday, thank you so much for the invitation and the teaching of so much knowledge and history that I did not have before. And as was already mentioned, happy birthday to our mayor. Thank you very much for those words. We'll now move on to the explanation of, of the zoning process. Uh, the process begins with applications submitted to the planning staff for review. Cases, um, there are two types of cases on the agenda, Deci decisions and hearings. Decisions on cases are for which a public hearing has been previously held, there will be no further public comment. In hearings, anyone wishing to speak is asked to see the clerk before the start of the hearing. Staff has a presentate, has time for a presentation that has no time limit. Then the petitioner and those in favor get three minutes combined to present their case, unless their opponent signed up to speak or if staff is in opposition. If, those, if either one or both of those are the case, the petitioner gets 10 minutes, the opponents get 10 minutes combined, um, and the petitioner gets a two minute rebuttal. If no one is opposed or signed up to speak, staff provides a short presentation, the public hearing is closed, and then the next public hearing is open. Then the petition goes to the Zoning Committee of the Planning Commission for review and recommendation. Now I will introduce the Zoning Committee Vice Chair, uh, Doug Douglas Welton, um, um, who will introduce uh, the members present. Uh, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, members of council. My name is Douglas Welton. I am serving as the vice chair of the Zoning Committee of the Planning Commission. Uh, allow me to introduce the commissioners who are with me here tonight. We have Melissa Gaston, Courtney Rhodes, and Terry Lansdale. Uh, be joining us later, uh, Will Russell and Har uh, Ronnie Harvey. The Zoning Committee will meet on Tuesday, January 31st at 5 p.m. here in the Government Center. At that meeting, the Zoning Committee will meet to discuss and make recommendations on the petitions that have a public hearing tonight. The public is welcome at that meeting, but please note it is not a continuation of the public hearing that is being held here tonight. Prior to that meeting, you are welcome to make contact with us and provide input. You can find contact information uh, on each of the petitions uh, and for the uh, commissioners on the city's website at charlotteplanning.org. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we have several um, hearings and decisions um, that are requesting uh, deferrals um, at this time. Just making sure that's all we have is deferrals. Thank you very much. So I will, I will read. Oh, sorry. One one step before that, we have a 10 p.m. recess rule here um, during zoning committee. Um, uh, excuse me, during, during zoning meetings. Uh, the city council may recess long zoning meetings at 10, 10 p.m. Um, and reconvene them at a later date. Generally, if we have to dismiss, um, we reconvene at the next business meeting, which would be Monday, uh, January 23rd. Thank you very much. Sorry, I just got handed an item that is it being added to our deferral list? So, well. I will read these deferrals and then um, we can um, make a motion and pass them um, all at once. 
So item number six, uh, by uh, uh, petition number 2021-209, um, is, is, is a decision that is being deferred until February 20th, 2023. Item number seven, 2021-213, by Goldberg Companies Incorporated, is a decision that has asked to be deferred until February 20th, 2023. Item number eight, by Providence Capital Group, uh, Providence Group Capital, is a decision that is requesting to be deferred until February 20, 20th, 2023. Item number nine, 2022, petition number 2022-065 by Griffin Family Investments is a decision um, being requested uh, to be deferred until February 20th, 2023. Item number 10, petition number 2022 Dash 071 by MTB Holdings LLC is a decision requesting deferral until February 20th, 2023. Item number 14, petition number 2022 042 by Brian Ignema um, is a decision requesting deferral until February 20th, 2023. Item number 17, petition number 2022. Dash 277 by Buildum LLC is a hearing requesting deferral until February 20th, 2023. Item number 18, petition number 2022-029, Wade Miller Skyline Towns LLC is a hearing requesting deferral until February 20th, 2023. Item number 19, 2022. Uh, dash 037 by Suncap Property Group, LLC, um, is a hearing that is requesting deferral until February 20th, 2023. Item number 20, 20 uh, petition number 2022-066 by Wood Partners is a hearing which is being, uh, uh, deferral is being requested till March 20th, 2023. Item number 21, 2022, Dash 112 by the Charlotte Mecklenburg Hospital Authority is a hearing that is requesting deferral until May 15th, 2023. Item number 24, petition number 2022 084 by Mission Properties is a hearing requesting deferral until February 20th, 2023. Item number 26, petition number 2022 109. Urban Trends Real Estate Incorporated is a hearing that is requesting deferral until February 20th, 2023. Item number 27, petition number 2022-142 by EC Legacy Properties LLC is a hearing requesting deferral until February 20th, 2023. Item number 28, petition number 2022-076 by Sam Smart is a hearing requesting deferral until February 20th, 2023. And last but not least, item number 29, petition number 2022-092, also by Sam Smart, is a hearing requesting deferral until February 20th, 2023. I'll make a motion to defer. Second. We have a motion that's been made and properly second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor of that motion, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Hearing none, seeing none, that vote is unanimous. So we will move on uh, to the decisions portion of our agenda. We will start uh, with our consent agenda items. Rezoning petition items number three through five may be considered in one motion, except unless there are um, uh, petitions that are being pulled by a council member. For those that are watching, please note that these peti petitions meet the following criteria. It's had no public opposition to the petition at the public hearing. The zoning committee recommends approval, and there were no changes after the zoning committee's recommendation and staff also recommends an approval. Move to adopt and approve. Second. Second. Are there any consent uh, items that council members would like to pull? There are none. A motion that's been made and properly second. Any discussion? 
Hearing none, all in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Seeing none, that motion passes unanimously. Um, I'm sorry, uh, it, do I have, it says I have to read those petitions by um, individually for the record. So I guess, no. no? All right, sounds good. Thank you very much. So um, we have no items that um, have changes after the zoning committee vote. So we will bypass that portion since we don't have to explain. Ms. Mayfield? Mayfield, don't we have one that has a change from the TOD? To a UR3, is that required? Isn't that one? The one that was off of Mount Holly. We have run the change to a UR3. They changed it to UR3 to from to TOD. Vote that that is not significant. Yeah, we need don't to see from staff. we have to wait to number 16? I don't think that's so. So I believe uh, what is being referenced is an email we received from a, a council member earlier. The petitioner is not making that request. Um, so I don't think that 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 counts. I think what we're uh, anticipating is that that is going to be a discussion item. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when it, that, it, but it, first the that. council member would have to make the motion the petitioner or staff the petitioner has not changed um, the petition okay that That's makes that. sense yeah. okay thank you very much all right um, we all move on um, to our decision portion of it of our agenda So we are going to start with, and if I'm correct, uh, agenda item number three. Is that correct? No, no that's what we just approved. We, we started with number 11. Oh, yeah, sorry, 11. three through five, sorry. We started with number 11. Yeah. With 11. Yeah. Number 11. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, let's go to this top. Item number 11. Should be fine. Rezoning <laughs> petition 2021-232 yeah. <laughs> by uh, Chick-fil-A, uh, <laughs> which is located on approximately 0.88 acres bound by the east side of Randolph Road on the west side of Colwick Road, north of Sharon Amity Road, in Council District 6, Mr. Bakari's district. The current zoning is B1, neighborhood business, and the proposed zoning is B2CD, general business conditional. The zoning committee voted seven to nothing to recommend approval of this petition, and staff recommends approval of this petition. Is there a motion to approve the petition and adopt the zoning committee's statement of consistency as it appears in our agendas and on the screen as the council's own. Move to adopt and approve. Second. Okay. We have a motion that's been made and seconded. Um, is there any discussion on the motion? I will, if Mr. Jipakari. Um, so this one has obviously gotten some attention. Uh, I, I think it's important for us to all remember a couple basic things with this. One is Chick-fil-A as a business has been operating out of this location for a lot of years uh, as a very good neighbor um, to the neighborhoods that are around there. And uh, whether we decide to go down this path tonight or not, they will still operate in that spot uh, as a very good neighbor. Uh, we heard from the community early on in this, the same folks we had heard from a couple months before that were highly opposed to the density because of a lot of the infrastructure problems we know exist to the other very controversial rezoning there. And that same organized group came back to us actually supportive of this. And the reason they're supportive is simple. Not only is Chick-fil-A a good neighbor uh, and is part of their community, uh, this is to take an existing use that will be there no matter what on a very dense, highly traveled by vehicles corridor, and it will make that incrementally better and will enable their customers to get uh, their product more quickly. So in the end, this is what the business wants. This is what the vast majorities of the organized neighborhoods asked us to do. And it makes for a better, um, a better business experience and a better uh, use of our transportation corridor in a place of town that is severely, severely underinvested in infrastructure. So I would uh, ask that my colleagues come together 
uh, for those of you who um, are wishing that this was a more a less car centric solution, I think a lot of people wish that. In sublevel, I even wish that. But we have to look at reality as it exists today. And people are not crossing this very busy intersection uh, because we have said walkability uh, is something we want. We have to invest in that in the long term. And meanwhile, we have someone in the private sector investing in an innovative way to get more cars through quickly a very dangerous area. So I would ask you all to join in supporting um, what is, uh, I believe, a good uh, rezoning petition. Thank you, Mr. Bukhari. Um, I'll uh, uh, recognize myself. Um, Mr. Petten, I have a, a couple questions. Um, is, is it clear, um, after looking back at the public uh, hearing, um, that uh, the, these proposed uses uh, would be allowed by right um, on this particular parcel um, uh, when the UDO goes into effect on January 1st, on June, uh, June 1st, excuse me? Yes, thank you. So the property is currently zoned B1. Uh, which on June 1st, <clears throat> when the zoning translation happens from the UDO, that will go to General Commercial, which is our CG district. The CG district does allow, uh, has permitted use as allotments for both the drive-through uh, establishment, which is a business that primarily does uh, its operations solely through drive-through service, or a drive-through facility, which is a business that uses a drive-through as an accessory to uh, their business function. So both would be allowed uh, under prescribed conditions uh, in the commercial zoning district. This would translate to that zoning district on June 1st without any rezoning taking place as part of the UDO effective date. Uh, so could this be a potential uh, permitted use? Yes, there are prescribed conditions. Those would need to be uh, worked through and explored and how they affect the site, but overall it is a allowed use in the use table. So uh, the they would have to meet prescribed um, uses for that to be allowed, but uh, a petitioner um, said during the public hearing that they would not be able to meet those prescribed um, uses. So would this be allowed by right with, um, with, with taking what the uh, petitioner said at face value? Um, on it would this have to be, and it would have to meet all the prescribed conditions to be approved by staff. Administratively, yeah. Oh, so, so this wouldn't be approved by staff if they're. It, it would have to meet all any of the design criteria, building placement location, drive-through lane locations, uh, all the prescribed conditions, plus any other development standards that are in the UDO. They would all have to be met, similar to any other by right project, before any approval could be done at a staff level. Thank you. I would just note for my colleagues that uh, the petitioner themselves have said they would not be able to meet the prescribed conditions, and that is in fact why they are here um, with this con conditional rezoning um, in the first place. Um, is the median that is being put in, uh, does it, is it a, a pedestrian refuge? Uh, the one that's being proposed for this project, uh, I don't believe the median that's proposed for this project has one. There is a refuge uh, in front of the public, if I recall correctly. So I'm getting nods from CDOT. So if, if a, uh, uh, okay, thank you. Um, is, uh, is it the belief of staff that um, because of this median, uh, cars will only approach this drive-through um, from one direction inbound on Randolph Road? And, and, and did that, did that um, play into staff's recommendation? I'll defer to the actual transportation part of the question and I'll follow up as on the recommendation side. So movements would be restricted to a right turn into the development along Randolph, um, but there would be access from the rear uh, of the site. So uh, the potential um, vehicles could access the site from uh, a few different directions, um, just not left in to the development off of Randolph Road. So do we not think that cars will make U-turns around, around that median going outbound on Randolph to try to access? I think that would be um, on enforcement professionals uh, to, to make sure that wasn't happening. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to read into the record um, a, a letter that we received uh, from the chair of the planning commission. Um, uh, you know, after uh, a conversation with her, uh, Kiba Samuel, 
um, after the <coughs> zoning you. committee's vote. Um, she wrote this, uh, please vote no on rezoning petition 2021-232 by Chick-fil-A. Approving this rezoning and allowing for more auto intense use of this site in an area that is becoming more urban, an area where council has recently approved additional density is highly contradictory. I believe it will set a dangerous precedent for any additional EDEEs in this or adjacent blocks and likely allow for further auto intense development. Allowing more cars to sit idling in queue goes against the action areas in the CAP and against goal six of the 2040 comprehensive plan to quote, enable healthy and active lifestyles by reducing exposure to harmful environmental contaminants, unquote. The last bullet point outlined in the staff recommendations section of the final staff analysis is, quote, the petition could facilitate the following 2040 comprehensive plan goals. Goal one, a 10 minute neighborhood. Goal five, safe and equitable mobility. Goal eight, diverse and resilient economic opportunity. However, as I evaluated this petition, I found that the petition does not meet key elements of these goals as follows. Goal 5.C, increase access to sustainable and zero carbon transportation modes and mobility options to support our strategic energy action plan. Goal 5.D, increase the share of trips made without a car to broaden the connectivity and capacity of our transportation infrastructure. Goal eight, the overall objective. Charlotteans will have opportunities for upward mobility to align education and skill levels with a diverse mix of employment opportunities, especially in the city's targeted and supported industries. I was originally hesitant to deliver this communication considering my role as chair of the planning commission. I assure you this is not an attempt to undermine the work of the zoning committee members or planning staff. I've spoken directly to the chair of the zoning committee, as well as our intern planning director, Craig, and informed them both of my intent to send this communication. My opinion just happens to be opposite theirs in this particular case, and I feel strongly enough about it to send this message to you all. I do not currently support a ban on all drive throughs but we must be extremely careful, thoughtful, and forward-looking when considering expanding drive through allowances in areas of our city that we know are densifying. This particular petition might be an example of competing priorities, increase of walkability and to reduce environmental burdens versus increasing auto intensive uses and attempting to mitigate traffic concerns, which in my opinion were primarily created by the petitioner. In this scenario where you have a choice to A, deny this petition, reject the potential setting or, of, of detrimental precedent, move us a little closer to a less auto dependent community, positively impact sustainability efforts, focus on moving people, not just cars, and to allow and request or require the retail retailer to mitigate traffic issues that it has helped create. Or you can take choice B and approve this rezoning. Please choose option A and deny this petition. Um, I would ask the, the vice chair of the planning commission, uh, uh, I mean, of the zoning committee, excuse me, of the planning commission. Uh, do we think uh, that this type of development is appropriate land use in urban? Uh, point, of point, of order, order. point of order. Okay. Point of order. Point of order. Yeah. They have voted. That, that, there's a process for this. Yeah. They have voted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My hand is being off. I can't do this. Okay. Uh, what can I not? What? Um, uh, what is? What is? The, 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 how? Can, how are we allowed to or not allowed to ask questions to the zoning committee? Ms. Hagler. Yeah, you you are allowed to ask questions of the zoning committee. Yes. They have voted. We can ask. Well, that questions. discussion is closed. Oh my God. There's a process for bringing this to that committee and for talking yeah. about it. They went through it. They discussed it. They voted. And I think that point in this discussion has passed. I really think this is. Ms. Hagel Gray? I, I thought that um, the uh, Mayor Pro Tem was asking uh, the zoning committee to respond to the um, planning chair's um, comments. Yes. Um, if uh, we are out of the realm of the public hearing, um, in the decision portion of 
um, the zoning meeting, there has been an opportunity for um, council to ask questions, specific questions of um, petitioners. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that we've ever had the question asked to a zoning committee member. We asked that during the um, ascent zoning uh, decision um, in NODA last year. We've asked questions. We can ask. Okay. It's a, it's a, you're, you're presiding, Mayor Pro Tem? Okay. Vice Chair Weldon, uh, given the, uh, uh, yeah, I, the chair of the Planning Commission's um, um, statement, um, can you please respond uh, to the appropriateness of uh, drive throughs in these urban centers as, as, as outlined in the uh, nice. policies that she cited? That's for a point of information. He's asking them to revisit their decision. Out of order. It needs to be a specific, a specific question. Um, a specific question for them to answer. Okay. Specific uh, informational uh, question. Yeah. Okay. Given given the, the chair of the planning commission statement, we have a contradiction between the planning commission, the, the interpretation of the chair of the planning he commission. Has no standing in this process. <laughs> <laughs> Can you please respond to the appropriateness? Okay, thank you. Um, Mayor Pro Tem, I will say that the uh, zoning commission, zoning committee, uh, dutifully examined all of the uh, information that was in front of us. We all uh, had an opportunity to meet with the petitioner and to get feedback from the community. We all uh, unanimously voted for this petition to recommend it. And uh, I believe that we all continue to stand by that approval. I'm getting mostly head nods. So that is, that is what we, uh, we said, that is what we meant. Thank you very much. Yes. Ms. Ashmira. Thank you. Thank you. So this might be very rare, but I, I agree with Mr. Bukhari on this one. <laughs> um, as many of you know, I've been a champion for our strategic energy action plan. And I don't find any, I, I don't find anyone that is more of a champion than Mr. Lansdell, who serves on our zoning committee who has worked on CEP in and out. And I had an opportunity to review all the comments that were made at the zoning committee meeting. And I appreciate the work that's been done by the zoning committee. Uh, they clearly note that the infrastructure improvements that, are, that petitioner is making, that's over $70,000. Uh, I really enjoyed reading about how much work that has gone into this and zoning committee took their time to really dig deeper, uh, especially Commissioner Guzman, that I, uh, some, of his, some of the comments that are made here I agree with that says, I generally do not support drive-through in rezoning in an area that is pedestrian friendly. And I agree with that sentiment. But he goes on to say that this petition is exceptional because it's continuing uh, it's a continuing of our current use with significant accommodations that helps with pedestrian environment. So um, someone who doesn't uh, necessarily believe that we should have more drive-throughs, uh, this really helps us create more pedestrian-friendly environment because of the improvements that petitioner is making in, in the uh, infrastructure, especially creating more opportunities for pedestrians. Um, so we had to look at every rezoning petition on a case-by-case -case basis. So I, I see um, because of the community benefits it's offering, I do support and I appreciate the work that Zoning Committee has done. Um, I, and I hope that my colleagues will actually look at uh, this petition on an individual basis and look at the improvements and community benefits that it's providing to a larger community. 
and how it's, pro how it's um, actually making our infrastructure more safer for pedestrians. So someone could walk up to a window and place an order. And it's really creating an environment that we want. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Graham. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. I, I too echo my support of, of the petition. Um, and I, I think by the reaction of, of everyone around the dais, the, the inappropriateness uh, of, of, of the request to challenge the zoning committee. I, I think the, the zoning committee does a really good job. Um, um, I, I, I'm just going here, and I won't read into the record. There's 10 points of, of um, recommendations of why they approved it in, in our booklet. I mean, it's, it's um, very consistent um, uh, in terms of why they voted the way they did. Um, I read it before I got here and I understood it. Um, um, their approval, I think Councilmember Ashmere has uh, talked about the, the $70,000 of road improvement and uh, all the hard work they've done. Um, the community supports it. Um, I, I just think that um, we, we really, really ought to be careful uh, uh, in, in terms of how we conduct our business affairs um, as a unit, as a group. and. Uh, I'll, I'll say that for the record. Thank you. Mr. Bakari. It, it's just a final three points here, just based on what I've heard. Number one, this was a drive through yesterday. It's a drive through today. And no matter what we do around here, it'll be a drive through tomorrow. The question at hand is someone with their own dollars in the private sector has decided to come forward and invest to make it better, more efficient, more walkable. Uh, so that's the question at hand. Number two, um, I, aside from the inappropriateness of questioning the great hardworking zoning committee, is the highly inappropriate nature of a, a, the planning commission member sending that note. We have specific processes and roles, and I have already asked staff to look deeply into that because when you serve on this body or a body as an appointee, you are serving on behalf of a unit, not yourself, and you have to fall into those roles. I think that is very important, and I am formally making that request that this get look, gets looked into and addressed because I've, I've never seen something like that in the 20 years I've been watching this body operate. And then finally, three, um, I, just, I, I think it is very important that we send a message, and my colleague, Councilmember Graham, uh, just alluded to it, and I'll say it a little more specifically, uh, to our friends in leadership in Raleigh on both sides of the aisle. Um, there is a majority of people who are approaching this in a balanced manner, trying to figure out transportation, moving people, investing in our infrastructure. And every once in a while, individual voices come out, and they say things that ruffle feathers up there, uh, that seem to villainize cars. And I know to many of you it looks like People are thumbing their nose at businesses investing in our infrastructure and at Raleigh. But I will tell you, look at the holistic approach as we walk towards this tactical decision, but macro decisions we're trying to make uh, in a balanced manner and know that we're doing our best. Thank you. Call the question. Uh, no, everybody has not gotten the turn to speak. I will say, regardless of your level of service, you are a constituent. You have the right to be able to approach your governing bodies, just like um, no, uh, our city workers do every every year um, around budget time. Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you for your leadership. And I also want to thank Ms. Samuels for the information. Um, Mr. T Bacari does, or Council Member Bacari does not speak for council when he asks for an investigation. So I appreciate your leadership as always. Um, and I won't be supporting the petition. Thank you. I'll make a motion to a substitute motion to defer this petition so staff can take another look at this. You play games. Second. Uh, really? Motion that's been made and properly second. All in favor of that substitute motion, please raise your hand. All in opposition, please raise your hand. That motion fails. Motion uh, to close discussion. Yes. There is no. Yeah, there second. is no more discussion. Uh, the, the, the original motion uh, will be um, all in favor of the original motion. Please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, um, all opposed. Please raise your hand. That motion passes eight to three.
We move on to item number 12, rezoning petition 2021-284 by Beacon Acquisitions, LLC, and Crescent Communities, which is located on approximately 146.9 acres, located on the west side of Rhine Road, Road south of Mount Holly Road and north of Bell Mead Drive. It is in the ETJ um, in, in, in County Commission District 2, Ms. Leake's District, and closest to City Council District 3, Ms. Watlington's District. The current zoning is I-1, I-2CD, and R-3, um, light industrial, general industrial, conditional, and single family residential, lower Lake Wiley protected area. The proposed zoning is I-1, CD, light industrial, lower Lake Wiley protected area. The zoning committee voted four to one to recommend approval of this petition and staff recommends approval of this petition. Is there a motion to approve the petition and adopt the zoning committee statement of consistency as it appears in our agendas and on the screen as the council's own? So I move. make that motion. Second. Motion has been made and properly second. Is there any discussion? All in favor of that, uh, Ms. Watlington? Yep. Um, so I just want to say that I did get a chance to meet with the petitioner and the neighborhood leaders again this month. And despite modifications made to the petition, the majority of community leaders, primarily Rapid, Rapids at Bell Mead, still oppose this petition, mm -hmm. uh, with their main concern being the proximity of large scale industrial to their homes, as well as lack of mixed uses and amenities in the area. It is a long term concern for uh, residents of the northwest side, uh, and they are still adamantly opposed. Uh, the majority of the residents are still adamantly opposed to this position, so I will not be supporting. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of, of, of adoption and approving, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All opposed, please raise your hand. Three. That motion passes eight to three. Moving to item number 13. Rezoning petition 2022-033 by TMBTR of the Carolinas LLC, which is located on approximately 48.49 acres on the south side of Alexandriana Road and on the east side of North Lake Center Parkway, north of Interstate 485 in the ETJ in uh, uh, County Commission District 1, Ms. Powell's District, and closest to City Council District 4, Ms. Johnson's District. The current zoning is R3 Single Family Residential and BP Business Park. The proposed zoning is MX2 Mixed Use uh, District Innovative. The Zoning commission, com Committee voted six to one to recommend approval of this petition and staff recommends approval of this petition. Is there a motion to approve the petition and adopt the Zoning Committee statement of consistency as it appears in our agendas and on the screen as the council's own? So moved. Second. Okay. The motion has been made and properly second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, uh, um, please raise your hand. Any opposed? That is unanimous. We move on to item number 15, rezoning petition 2022-058 by Baldwin SREA LLC, Hampstead SC, SC SRE LLC, and Baldwin SRE-C LLC. On approximately 3.4 acres bound by the south side of Baldwin Avenue, on the west side of East 4th Street, and on the east side of East 3rd Street, north of Queens Road, and Council District 1, Ms. Anderson's District. The current zoning is MUD O mixed use development optional, and the proposed zoning is MUD O SPA mixed use um, the development optional with the site plan amendment. The zoning uh, committee voted seven uh, to nothing to recommend approval of this petition, um, and staff recommends approval of this petition. Is there a motion to approve the petition and adopt the zoning committee's statement of consistency as it appears in our agendas and on the screen as the council's own? So moved. Second. There's a motion that's been made and properly second. Is there any discussion? I'll recognize myself real quick. Uh, there was an uh, email that was sent um, to uh, by the Cherry community, which um, they they uh, voiced their displeasure um, overall, um, but they agreed with the, the rezoning and the site plan amendment, um, and they wanted their um, uh, the consistency statement to be concise um, uh, um, uh, from the zoning committee's adopt uh, 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 proposed language again. The motion is to adopt the zoning committee's consistency statement just to reassure them that is what we're doing and we are not expanding it um, in any way shape or form um, so if, with no further comment all in favor of this petition please raise your hand all opposed please raise your hand seeing none that motion passes unanimously 
move on to item number 16, rezoning petition 2022-067 by CC Fund 3 LLC. It's located on approximately 5.92 acres on the southwest intersection of Sam Wilson Road and Wilkinson Boulevard, north of Old Dowd Road. Again, in the ETJ, um, in uh, County Commission District 2, Ms. Leake's District, and closest to City Council District 3, Ms. Watlington's District. Current zoning is I2CD, General Industrial Conditional, with a lower Lake Wiley protected area, the B and B B2, General Business, with a lower Lake Wiley protected area. The proposed zoning is TODNC, Transit Oriented Development, Neighborhood Center, Lower Lake Wiley protected area. And the zoning committee voted seven to nothing to recommend approval of this petition, and staff recommends approval of this petition. Is there a motion to approve the petition and adopt the zoning committee statement of consistency as appears in our agendas and on the screen as the council's own? Mayor Pro Tem. I move to um, approve the rezoning petition 2022-067 from B2 and I2 conditional to UR3 with the following consistency statement. This petition is found to be consistent with the 2040 policy map based on the information from the staff analysis and the public hearing and because the adopted policy map recommends the innovative mixed use place type. Therefore, we find this petition to be reasonable and in the public interest based on the information from the staff analysis and the public hearing and because the site is along a transit corridor served by a bus route, making it an appropriate location for development allowed by the UR3 zoning district that further encourages pedestrian oriented form of development and transit connections. The use of conventional UR3 zoning applies standards and regulations to create desired form and intensity of development and a conditional rezoning is not necessary. The innovative mixed use place type allows for office, research and development, studios, light manufacturing, showrooms, hotels, and multifamily residential uses. The UR3 zoning district generally maintains a high level of design standards and is appropriate when adjacent to a neighborhood one place type. This site is adjacent to neighborhood one to the southwest. The petition could facilitate the following 2040 comprehensive plan goals. 10 minute neighborhoods, neighborhood diversity and inclusion, trail and transit oriented development, safe and equitable mobility, and health, healthy, safe, and active communities. So per our city, um, ordinance code, we are able to, under section 6.1115 of the ordinance, to approve a rezoning petition to a higher zoning district than the existing or proposed zoning district without a new public hearing. Therefore, I move to approve. Second. With UR3. So we have a motion to change the proposed zoning district to UR3 um, and to adopt the consistency statement that Ms. Whit Watlington read into record as our own. Um, Ms. Hagler Gray, can you please for, I think there's some council members that have questions and maybe for the folks that tune into our zoning um, uh, meetings. Um, I understand that this is allowed un under the rules, so can you just confirm that? And Yes, Ms. Watlington is correct, um, section 6.1. 111 allows for uh, conventional petitions to be um, for the council to um, convert them to a higher classification or one between um, the property covered um, and the property. Uh, Dave may have, he may have to help me with this, but in particular, it means you may up zone with a conditional petition. You would have to have the consent of the petitioner to do that. But this is a conventional petition. Mr. Petten, do you have anything to add and to explain? No, that, that was correct. Um, is there any discussion? Ms. Watlington. Yeah, I just wanted to note that I met with the petitioner, community leaders, and legal and zoning staff, as you heard, and I'm pleased to share that we have reached a satisfactory solution since the last uh, meeting. In addition to the Palo change that I mentioned, I just wanted to note that the petitioner has volunteered to donate $50,000 to the Westside Community Land Trust in support of our housing goals. So I'm excited that we were able to get this work done, and I thank you for the petitioner and the petitioner's agent, uh, as well as Sharice Blackman over at the Land Trust for getting creative on this one. Mr. Driggs, you don't want to uh, That was basically my question. I, I, I mean, yes, we don't need a new hearing. I just wonder why this didn't get modified before it came up before us with the intended zoning category in it, and I support what you're saying, right? So, so. Uh, I'm all in favor of doing it. I just have a procedural question as to 
because in nine years I've never seen this. Uh, why couldn't this have been amended before it came up uh, in front of us and then had us determine that it was not necessary to send it back to the zoning committee? That's the usual process. Is, is this different or? This is different. I've been doing it 20 years and I've never seen it done, so. Well, I'm not gonna compete with you. I just, uh, <laughs> I'm just- of firsts. Uh, you, you win, okay? I just, uh, I've never seen it, so. Okay, I'm good. Yeah. Question answered. Just confirm, you said everyone says this works for them. Yes. Fantastic, I can't wait to see what the next thing we okay. do as a first tonight. I'm glad you worked it out actually. So, <laughs> yes, yeah. well done. Thank you. Any further discussion? <laughs> Hearing none, all in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. All opposed? That motion passes. Well, thank you. That is the last decision we have. May I put down, before we move on, may I ask a question of our attorney? Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Ms. Hagler, great. What, do we have a precedent since we're setting all these new <laughs> moves, these new precedences tonight? If we had a vote and I realized that I raised my, I voted, I didn't vote the way that I wanted to vote on an item number. Mm -hmm. So do I know we had precedent years ago, but do we have precedent to go back on a vote? In, in the same meeting. In this yes. meeting. Because yes. for item number 12, which was petition number 2021-284, the motion passed, but I need to be on record as a no to that vote, not as a yes, and I was looking at the wrong number. I had the wrong item pulled up on my computer. So I just wanted to clarify that for the record. Oh, well. I think you can clarify it for the record. We're still in It does not change anything. The motion passed. I just want to have the, the record clarified. So the city clerk can clarify your vote. Are you good with that, Ms. Tynes? Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Potem. Thank, Thank you, colleagues. Thank you very much. So we will move on to our public hearings. <clears throat> Start with agenda item number 20, uh, 22, rezoning petition 2021-261 by Josh Zazowski for approximately 3.5 acres located on the north side of Billy Graham Parkway, west of, west of South Tryon Street, in Council District, thank you. Um, in, in Council District Three, uh, Miss Watlington's district, um, the current zoning um, is R17MF multifamily residential, and the proposed zoning is I2CD general industrial conditional. Staff recommends approval of this petition. Uh, we have uh, no speakers against, so after the staff's presentation, the petitioner will have three minutes. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. 2021, 261, three and a half acres on Billy Graham Parkway. <clears throat> it is currently zoned R17MF. As mentioned, proposed zoning is for I2 conditional. Uh, adopted place type is for innovation mixed use, which does support uh, some general industrial uses. Uh, the I2 uses that are being proposed don't fully match up, but there are some limitations to those, uh, which we can get into here on the next slide. Uh, so this is a conditional plan, mainly just proposing site conditions, no uh, you know, site plan that's associated with it, that's just a restriction on uses, which we've seen in the I2 district just to uh, start to get some of those uh, more challenging uses off the site, things like adult establishments, abattoir, which is essentially a slaughterhouse, uh, amusement, commercial outdoors, animal crematoriums, automobile rentals and service stations, and et cetera, all the things that we find in I2 that are uh, a bit less uh, favorable for this site were conditioned out of the, the uh, uh, this zoning request. Uh, also does commit to comply with the post-construction stormwater ordinance, tree ordinance, and all buffer and screening requirements for the I-2 district. Uh, as mentioned, staff does recommend approval. Uh, it uh, says it's consistent for innovation mixed use. I believe your staff analysis this might have been one that was updated after we put the slides together early on uh, this month. Uh, we did determine that it was in, inconsistent with that innovation mixed use, mainly because some of those I-2 uses uh, don't directly translate. No real concerns from staff, just wanted to point out that inconsistency. So with that, uh, we'll answer any questions you may have. I don't know if we have any speakers signed up, but uh, if not, we'll answer questions whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Um, Michael Cox and Josh Zosky, uh, you have three minutes. Yes, sir. Well, I wasn't 
Uh, that happens, man. Take your time. So, good evening. Um, my name is Michael Cox, and uh, Josh couldn't make it tonight, unfortunately. He had something that tied him up last minute, so he apologizes. But thank you for having me, and thank you for your time. Uh, I'm not sure who's controlling the PowerPoint, but uh, you've got it. Oh, is it B? Okay, perfect. So I'm with Caprock. We're, we're a developer here in town. Um, been here for a while. A lot of uh, mixed use developments, townhomes, office. I mean, kind of, kind of all over the place. But we're we're kind of leading the charge on this specific project. Obviously, you know the timeline. Don't need to get through that. So I think the biggest thing I'd like to kind of walk through first with this is is kind of where you're at and wh where we are here. So we are right off of Billy Graham at the end of Woodridge Center Business Park. That's a private road. So if you look, if you're so if you're heading south away from town, down South Tryon, take a right into Billy Graham, right before you get to the next street, you take a right and then you double back on Woodridge Center Drive. So those buildings there make up Woodridge Center Business Park. It's a private community, it's a private road, it's it's funded by us, not maintained by the town. Um, at the end of it, kind of annexed outside of the business park is this triangular piece right here. It's kind of orphaned down there. There's obviously no access off Billy Graham, and right now there's no access through the business park either because it hasn't been accepted fully into the business park itself. Um, we control the site and own the site next door. We're planning another development there, and then we are, uh, one of my partners is the iHeartRadio building there. So. We are talking about bringing this into the business park, um, having kind of an office flex use for it. And so that multifamily zoning is, is what we're asking you to be changed to, to I-2 with the conditions. So kind of went through the, the prohibited uses that we talked through. That was really as recommendation in talking with Holly and, and planning staff there. But uh, open it up to any questions. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? Uh, Ms. Mayfield? Yes, I have a question for staff, actually. When we go down the listings of prohib prohibitions for the following uses, we don't have sweet steaks in there. And I was just wondering about that because I'm concerned that council, previous council, as well as community members and staff put a lot of time and energy into our 2040 policy plan. But we have a number of items that have come before us, even in these last three and a half months that I've been back, that are inconsistent. It creates a challenge for me where language was agreed upon, adopted, pushed forward to the community, but yet we still are accepting items that are inconsistent. And with each inconsistency, we're setting a new precedent for the next developer to say, well, you approve this, so the precedent has been set. Two separate questions help me understand the approval when it is clearly identified as inconsistent with the 2040 plan that a lot of time, talent, and funding went to create, as well as the question of in the future, why do we not have sweepstakes in our list of prohibited businesses? So the prohibited list of uses, I'll have to check to see if that's actually an allowed use in I-2. I'm not sure if it is or isn't. I'm not, I don't know if it's only in our commercial districts or if it's in our industrial districts. But if it's a use in our I-2 district, we will talk to the petitioner and see if that's a, a use they would consider including in the list of prohibitions. Uh, but I'd need to confirm how that, uh, whether or not, like I said, it's a permitted use in I-2. Uh, and as far as the inconsistency, the innovation mixed use place type does uh, envision some industrial uses, uh, more light, uh, light industrial type uses, and also a lot more of the kind of adaptive reuse of industrial sites for continued industrial use or other uses. So the conditions of uh, some of the uses that were prohibited through this petition, staff felt that they got close enough to that more of an I-1 type district, uh, which would be more compatible with IMU. And so say it, it is generally inconsistent, but there are some there is some overlap between what's being proposed uh, on this petition and then what would be allowed in the IMU. It's just not fully compatible across the board, but enough of that to where we still felt comfortable with, with the petition. So the challenge 
the challenge I have is the challenge I have with the inconsistency. But I also want my colleagues to think about as we're getting ready to have a discussion in a couple of weeks, when we're looking at rezoning residential land to industrial, we need industrial space. But I think it would be helpful if we had an actual plan and look at our city and identify areas for industrial because we are losing residential in a market that is quickly changing. And if we look back three years from now, looking back, we will see that in the last three to four years, a number of residential was rezoned into industrial and the impact that that's having. So I think we have an opportunity to really have some real conversations about what we want the city to look like. I love industrial, we need businesses. The question is, is residential area really the best place for it? And is there a possibility that we can be more directive on the type of industrial to make sure that down the line we're not getting calls like we're getting regarding, say, James, what are we having to discuss oh, right now? Oh, land? the landfill. landfill. A landfill right. or something that would cause a negative environmental impact. Thank you for answering the question. Thank you very much. Ms. Watlington, did you have your hand up? I did, but I'm okay right now. Thank you very much. Any further questions, comments? Hearing Order close. Second is a motion. Um, you made it properly second to close the public hearing. Any discussion of that? Hearing none, all in favor, close the public hearing. Please raise your hand. Any opposed? That is unanimous. We will move on to item number 23. Thank you. Uh, re rezone, thank you. Uh, rezoning petition 2022-059. By Taylor Morrison, located on approximately 50.7 acres along the west side of Garrison Road, east of Dixie River Road, and the ETJ uh, uh, County Commission District 2, Ms. Leake's District, and closest to City Council District 3, Ms. Watlington's District. The current zoning is MUD O uh, mi mixed use district um, optional with airport noise overlay and a lower Lake Wiley protected area, and R3 single family residential with the air no airport noise overlay and local. Lower Lake Wiley protected area. The proposed zoning is MX2 in, um, innovative, uh, mixed use district innovative with the airport noise overlay in the Lower Lake Wiley protected area. Staff does not recommend approval of this petition in its current form. Reduction in unit count um, and development outcomes that better align with neighborhood one place types could be considered for reevaluating staff's recommendation. Um, so after um, the uh, uh, staff's presentation, uh, the petitioner will have 10 minutes uh, to present. Thank you. 2022-059 is off Garrison Road. Uh, it's just a little over 50 and a half acres. It is currently zoned uh, MUD O uh, as well as R3. Both carry the uh, Lake Wiley protected area and the airport noise overlay uh, with both of those zoning districts. The proposed district is MX2. It would also maintain the same uh, excuse me, MX2 Innovative will also maintain those uh, airport noise and lower Lake Wiley protective overlays uh, as a result should the rezoning be approved. Uh, it is currently, as mentioned, recommended for neighborhood one for a good majority of the site along Garrison. Uh, you can see some areas that are outlined that fall in that blue shade are part of the community activity center, uh, primarily associated with uh, the river district that uh, is continually uh, ongoing. Uh, 2022-059, this does propose up to 335 single family detached, uh, single family attached, and multifamily dwelling units, mainly through quadruplexes. Uh, that comes in at about 6.6 .6 units per acre. Uh, building heights limited to 40 feet does provide innovative standards uh, that uh, facilitate the outcome of these units, essentially not having uh, individual lots for each unit and fronting pro public streets. Uh, so we've seen a few petitions like this one that was approved earlier this evening uh, that provide these innovative standards essentially to construct these, like I said, without uh, public street frontage or individual lots for each unit. Um, does prohibit vinyl as a building material except on windows and soffits and limits blank wall expansions for all corner and end units uh, to 10 feet. Uh, and does commit to transportation improvements, including a north, south, and east, west public street with stubs to adjacent properties. Uh, also a 60 foot right of way dedication along Garrison Road, as well as an eight foot planning strip and 12 foot multi-use path along that frontage. And then uh, public streets uh, would have an eight foot planning strip and six foot sidewalk uh, where those are found throughout the project. Uh, does it propose to include elements in the amenity areas, things like covered pavilion, shelter, benches, picnic tables, yoga room, et cetera, all would be proposed as amenities in those uh, 
uh, areas along the project and also provides a minimum of the 100 foot swim buffer or 60 feet beyond top of bank on both sides of Beaver Dam Creek to Mecklenburg County for a future greenway trail. As uh, mentioned earlier, staff does not recommend approval of this petition in its current form. It is inconsistent with the policy recommendation for neighborhood one. Uh, those areas that are in the community activity center uh, further within the site uh, would be consistent with, uh, with that place type, but overall generally inconsistent. Uh, staff did have some concerns about uh, the project outcome and uh, like I said, just uh, be happy to continue looking at it should we get some changes to the petition. So we'll take any questions following petitioner's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Brown. Ten minutes. Good evening, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members, Senate Committee Members, Colin Brown, uh, on behalf of the petitioner, Taylor Morrison. Uh, as Dave mentioned, this is similar to a, uh, a similar product type, and if I can get our slides up, thank you, um, that um, was approved earlier uh, next to North Lake Mall. Uh, this is Taylor Morrison's Yardley product, which is a new kind of housing type coming into the market that is a for rent product, but it's, it's, it's like a single family home or town home. Uh, so the, the, pro, the, the uh, person that lives there has, has a yard, has place to move around. So we think it is important in adding to our diverse housing stock. Uh, as Dave mentioned, and we recognize it, it's not consistent with the plan, and Councilmember Mayfield has, has pointed out some concerns with inconsistencies. I do think it's important what we've done here is we've laid in the River District, uh, which was a massive development uh, approved several years ago. You can see that in color really kind of wraps around this site. Uh, so we do think this is a, uh, an area that is going to change in the future and that this uh, product type would be much more in, in keeping with that. Additionally, we've got some industrial zoning to the south of us. Um, so that's, uh, we hope, and when we start thinking in the context of what is coming, this becomes more compatible. We we're, we're certainly understand um, uh, staff's concerns. We're going to continue to work with them, but I'll just put this, this is the 2040 map. So if you look at this, see everything up here is Community Activity Center. Uh, everything down here has got a manufacturing logistics. Uh, it looks like we're a little of a bit of a fish out of the water with this very low density recommendation. So we do have a fairly low density product type now uh, on the 50 acres. Uh, there would be 335 units, which is only about six and a half dwelling units per acre. Um, we feel like that's a good fit for the area. Um, this is a look at kind of conceptual, putting a little color on that so you can see how these lay out. Um, and then there's some concepts. It's, this is a new product, so it's a little hard for us to, for me to visualize what they look like. Here's the amenity area. Here's how these lay out. So th these are for rent. You can rent these, but again, it's laid out like a more traditional single family or townhome community, though focused around green spaces, uh, to, just to bring some more housing options to the area. Uh, we have had conversations with Council Member Watlington. I think she shares some of the concerns of the city staff and certainly a priority for, for Council Member Watlington and I think some of you is housing affordability. Um, so that's something the Taylor Morrison team has looked at uh, and kind of two options that, that we're putting on the table moving forward in addition to further discussions with city staff would one be a, a contribution uh, to the housing trust fund. Uh, in this case, that amount could be uh, up to $500,000, uh, which is about five times what would, is what would be required if you were qualifying for a bonus under the new ordinance. Uh, so we think that's substantial. Uh, otherwise, another option, and we could do one of these two, would be there is a location on the property where potentially we could donate five acres uh, to the city or a land trust uh, and kind of help with the development of that uh, for another organization to provide units. So uh, we're, we're open to feedback from you all and I understand we'll have, plan to have some conversations offline, uh, but we hope that is a step in the right direction. So again, this project providing some of that medium density housing, six and a half units per acre. Uh, we'll continue working with staff on some of the site planning issues and then expect that we could commit to one of these items uh, that would hopefully ensure that we can get some more affordability in this area or others. Uh, I know I've got 10 minutes, but I think that we'll, we're happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Any questions, Ms. Wellington? Um, can you pull the slide back up with the community uh, benefit? I, I would like to hear if you have comments now, uh, what your thoughts are in regards to this. So that's a question for all our colleagues. Sorry. Yeah, I, I was actually gonna make a comment on that specifically. Um, I would encourage you and all uh, petitioners that are listening uh, to start thinking about 
other options uh, that are more infrastructure related than affordable housing related. I may end up being in a minority on that point, but I think this council is starting to understand that um, our affordable housing need in this community, while very important and material, pales in comparison to our infrastructure needs right now. And um, we're just not getting it done on our own. So having an option where $500,000 is spent directly on the infrastructure that that community touches, sees, and feels every single day um, is important. And I think having that option, if, if you'd like to respond to that, I'd be interested. Don't you worry. Uh, we are in conversations with CDOT about improvement to that road. It is potentially expanding the cross section. Uh, so that's on the table and as well as talking with Charlotte Water and Charlotte Sewer. So, but I'm just saying at the end when that's done and if there's a $500,000 question of affordable housing or the equivalent of, of land, I'd rather see $500,000, a $500,000 option at least for infrastructure that that community gets to benefit in. Ms. Johnson. Once again, Council Member Bakari doesn't speak for all of us. <laughs> well, I was unaware of that. I thought I spoke for you. Let her, let her go. Let her go, please. So, you know, I mean, that's certainly an option, but um, I thank you. I thank you for, um, for raising the bar. That's what we want to see from developers. I know in District 4, um, I hope developers recognize that. I don't remember which um, attorney it was. I don't know if it was John or you, Colin. Um, when a developer donated $100,000 to the Sugar Creek area. Um, so um, I, I, we appreciate when the developers come in and, and consider the residents' um, needs and, and listen to the residents. So um, thank you. Thanks, thanks to the developer for those considerations, and we want to see more of that. I hope that this council's um, proven that we are engaged in the rezonings and you know we, we are adamant about not being perceived as rubber stamping the petitions so great job thank you miss mayfield I didn't hear thank you mayor pro tim for transparency mr brown already knows i have a challenge with for rent product but i have a very specific question that i need clarification on and that was regarding the comments from staff. The site does not have access to water and could significantly impact the capacity of the local sanitary sewer collection system. Please help me understand what water would this site be tapping into if this was one of the reasons that staff is not supporting this recommendation that they just shared on the screen either one of y'all jump in um I, I will say we we looked into it after we got that comment back from staff okay uh, per the documentation uh water's approximately a thousand feet from the site we would be extending water to the site um and would also open others to serve off that public water we have obtained a willingness to serve letter from charlotte utilities so you have reached out to Charlotte Water. So Charlotte Water, you're in discussion for us to add to where we already have some infrastructure challenges to accommodate these 330 plus units. But that is in discussion and that discussion happened after staff reviewed the initial submittal. I think there's a lot of development coming with River District and some of this industrial. Yes, it's a, a question of when it gets there and who builds okay. it to get there. Who gets there first? Second question I have, and this was, this is just me understanding. You had noted in two or three slides back, which let me backtrack. Thank you for the community commitments that are in the project. I'm just still looking at some different things because infrastructure is very important and we have some challenges. But we have, when you look at the breakdown, you're, the developer is committing to five feet between the units, so that's five feet on each side in the actual development. And this is a question since this is just a hearing that you can come back and we can follow up on. Let me know how much of a difference would that be if instead of five, it would be, say, 10. Here's the challenge. As we drive around communities now, 
and new developments that have been built that have that only five foot difference, that is also causing some challenges. That is causing some challenges with drainage. I've gotten a couple of calls from residents, mainly, again, we're seeing it in newer communities. That's causing some challenges. If there were to be an incident, fire, whatever, that's very close proximity. I know we're trying to fill in as much density as possible, but for the size of the land that we're working with right here and considering it is vacant, undeveloped land, if there is a possibility to look at if that will cause any financial, major financial challenges to go a little beyond the five feet, that will be helpful. And we can have a follow-up okay. conversation, but I wanted to put it on your radar now. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, just a couple of thank yous to the uh, Council Member Walton for her leadership. I think being chair of housing or whatever, the new, the new name for the community. Housing, safety, and community. <laughs> housing, safety, community. Uh, this is great. And Carla, thank you for you to develop, be willing to uh, show us how important affordable housing is by earmarking uh, this money. So thank you for our input, great leadership all the way around. And, uh, I agree with Council Member Johnson. I, I hope other developers will look at this and know that this could be a plus as we move forward. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I want to um, say something real quick. Um, you know, I, I think that last slide and, and the idea is, is, is a good idea, but I, I, I want to ask my colleagues for us to be cognizant and careful, um, honestly, given some of the decisions that we've made. Um, we've had a um, existential conversation as a community over the past several years of who do we want to be? Do we want to be a deal-making city or do we want to be a planned and planned oriented city? Um, the legacy of being a deal-making city um, has been thoroughly measured both, quant both quantitatively and qualitatively. And, and I stand behind the idea that um, the legacy of of some of those deals that have been made over time that have led to an inequitable city, I don't think they were all made um, uh, with bad intentions. In fact, I think some of those decisions uh, were made by people in position, in the same positions that we're in, with the best of intentions in mind. Um, but they have, time has, has led when they don't follow a specific plan, um, um, it can lead to bad things, it could lead to um, a map that is chopped up and doesn't fit together. And that's kind of why we have, have made the decisions to move away from those deal-making approaches to a more planned approach. Um, you know, again, that's why I didn't necessarily um, uh, uh, support the decision around $50,000 given to the land trust, while I certainly believe uh, that the land trust model is something that we should be paying into. Um, this is a discussion that we've had around about how our housing trust fund and, um, is going to operate moving forward. We have $50,000 or even $500,000 today is not the same as it was just last year. So I don't really know how we can quantify um, if $500,000 is enough and has the, the, the amount of impact um, uh, to deviate um, from the plan in this area. It could very well be a data-informed approach that we take. We certainly might be selling ourselves short. Um, so uh, I, I encourage us, again, uh, to remember the conversation and the policy work, the community-led policy work that we have been doing uh, to move away from being a deal-making city to a plan in a planned oriented facility, uh, city, um, and the danger, the real danger um, that deviating from that um, can have for future generations. Thank you. If yeah, I may, uh, Council Member Mayfield, I just got a note from the design team saying 16 feet between units. Thank you. Thank you. Motion to, we have a motion that's been made and seconded. Any discussion on that motion? All in favor, close the public hearing. Please raise your hand. Any opposed? That is unanimous. We will move on to item number 24. Oh, yes, Rezoning petition 2022.
2022-084 by Mission Properties. Oh, that, that one's located on approximately 21.85 acres along the south side of Ridge Road and the north side of Interstate 485. May Mayor Pro Tem, that one was deferred. Yeah, we're on 25. Mm. So we, yeah, we moved to item 25. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Let me defer 24, 25. All right. Agenda number 25, rezoning petition 2022-111 by Piedmont Natural, uh, Natural Gas Company for approximately 36.27 acres located on the east side of Rhine Road on the west side of Interstate 85, south of Mount Holly Road in the ETJ, uh, located in County Commission District 2, Miss Leak's District, and closest to City Council District 3, Miss Watlington's District. The current zoning is CC, Community Center, and B2, General Business Conditional, and the proposed zoning is I2CD, General Industrial Conditional. Conditional. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to land use, transportation, and site and building design. Um, there are no speakers against, uh, so after Mr. Petten's um, presentation, staff will have, I mean, petition will have three minutes. All right, thank you, 2022-111. Uh, it's just over 36 acres on Ryan Road, uh, close to backs up to I-485, uh, just south of Mount Holly Road. Uh, it's currently zoned CC uh, as well as B2 conditional uh, as the Lake Wiley protected area as an overlay. The proposed zoning is for I-2 conditional as well as to maintain the Lake Wiley protected area. Community activity center is the recommended place type. You can see some manufacturing logistics as well as uh, neighborhood two on the other side of the highway, that neighborhood one that's on that other side of Rhine Road was just previously uh, approved in the rezoning earlier uh, this evening for 2021-284. So essentially that side of Rhine Road goes now to that manufacturing logistics place type. Just wanted to make that uh, uh, point of reference for us given that decision earlier this evening. Uh, the proposal with this petition is for I-2 uses. That would include a 40,000 square foot office building, which you can see there that fronts Ryan Road, a 25,000 square foot warehouse right behind it, and a 10,000 square foot fabrication shop, 10,000 square foot storage building, uh, as well as a 5,000 square foot tech shed, uh, compressor pad, and a compressed natural gas filling station. Uh, you can see all those laid out throughout the site uh, and labeled. Uh, does request uh, five-year vesting, uh, also reserves the right to develop the site in one or more phases. Does commit to providing a $50,000 contribution to CDOT for future installation of a traffic signal at Rhine Road and Mount Holly Road. Uh, also commits to improvements along the Rhine Road frontage, including dedication of 41 feet of right-of-way, 8-foot planting strip, and 12-foot bolt-to-use path. Also limits the total number of driveways to two, including one full movement and one being exit only. Uh, building height would be limited to 49 feet and also provides a Class A 100-foot buffer along the northern property boundary uh, adjacent to some of the uh, multifamily residential. It does provide a fence and a 37-and-a-half-foot Class C buffer along the southern property boundary where adjacent to the commercial use, uh, which I believe is a auto dealership. Staff does recommend approval upon, upon resolution of outstanding issues related to land use, transportation, and site and building design. Uh, it is inconsistent overall with the policy map recommendation for community activity center. Uh, we did look at uh, the surrounding place types as well as the uh, potential rezoning that was across Farm Road and some of the industrial activity we've seen. And again, this is a petition that's I, I too in name uh, has more of an office component uh, and more functions as a kind of uh, headquarters spot for Piedmont Natural Gas, uh, who is uh, part of the petitioner group. Uh, and so with, with those kind of potential uses and some of the transition to more of that industrial uh, zoning districts that have occurred both before the rezoning earlier this evening on Rhine Road through some of those previous approvals from 2017 and beyond, uh, staff did feel that it wasn't an inappropriate uh, location for this ask uh, and felt that they've done a number of uh, improvements, particularly along some of the adjacencies uh, for us to uh, feel a little bit more comfortable with uh, what was being proposed. So with that, I'll turn it over to the petitioner and we'll take any questions following their presentation. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, my name is Anthony Fox <clears throat> with Parker Boyd, Adams and Bernstein. I'm accompanied here uh, by Ed uh, Moore with McAdams, um, members of the council and the zoning committee. It's good to be here. And, and by the way, Mayor Pro Tem, happy birthday. Um, Thank you. We're here tonight on behalf of a rezoning petition that will accomplish one thing, one thing only. It is to uh, 
to relocate the existing um, operations center for Piedmont Natural Gas that's currently located on South Tryon Street and Yancey Road onto this site. And as you, if you're familiar with that site, you'll understand why this site provides for a per perfect opportunity. Um, the property is located on Ryan Road between 45 and Mount Holly Road. Uh, it's approximately 36.27 acres. Its, it's existing use is currently undeveloped. Uh, the existing zoning on the site they've mentioned to you is commercial center and business 2 B2CD. Our proposed zoning is I2CD. I call it I2 light because that use is dictated by the myriad of uses that will occur as a component of an operations center that will exist on the site. We held two community meetings. Uh, the first one was held December of 2022. Um, the second one was held January 5th of 2023. The first one was not attended by any of the residents. We wanted to make sure we had residential input, so we had a second one. Multiple attendees existed. I mean, attended, and we made the presentation at that time. This is the current PG, a PNG operations center. You can see that some of the, the features that exist now will be carried over. This site is completely enclosed and fenced, and this proposed site will uh, enjoy the same benefit. The proposed use on the site will it will will have over five acres of tree save, stormwater detention of a 2.8 acres. It does have a 40,000 square foot office building that will be oriented toward the frontage of Ryan Road. Uh, the warehouse is about 25,000 square feet, uh, 15,000 square feet of storage and a fabrication component. There will be a buffer along Ryan Road. That may change as a result of the current uh, rezoning that was approved uh, tonight. Uh, that is the site plan. I've got Ed here to talk about the site plan, but it just, it just really goes into the things that I presented. This is the current and recent zonings that have occurred into, uh, in and around this site. You'll note that many of those zonings are I-2, I, uh, and so there are uses within the area already. That's an area of the site. One of the things, uh, it is uh, inconsistent, but it is reflective of surrounding trends in terms of development opportunity. And it is in, in part and mainly an office building accommodation. Uh, one of the things I wanted to get to is that we have made certain commitments in terms of talking with the neighbors and the neighborhood groups out there. We've reoriented the parking, we've increased buffering, and we've increased streeting, but we also have increased the amount of contribution toward Thank the you, right Fox. away from 50,000 to 7,000. I appreciate that. Um, if you have any further comments, you can send them to the clerk and they'll be distributed to um, uh, the uh, council members. Ms. Mayfield. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Mr. Fox, I do want to acknowledge and thank you for listening to the community. One of the questions I had when we met was specifically regarding the parking. So thank you, team up there, because you're right on the slide that I'm interested in. So for the community, if you notice that trucking, that truck trailer parking in the back, that is a concern that we're having throughout the city. Where do trucks park? So I appreciate the fact that energy and time was taken in this development to make sure that along with the layout and the design that there is designated parking for those large trucks so we can try to get some of them out of our neighborhoods and off of the sides of our highways. But I do have a specific question because staff has noted in here, the approval of this petition will revise the recommended place type as specified by the 2040 policy map from community activity center place type to manufacturing and logistics place type for the site. For staff, help me understand for the development that is around it and that potentially may come around it, is that stating that if we were to move forward and approve this, then that will be our new community activity center place type in that area? No, it would mean the, that community activity center place type transitions to logistics. This, to yeah, and, and I logistics. think there was probably, and, and we may go back and discuss a little bit internally as well, whether that would go to it's going to I-2 conditional, which would directly translate to M&L, but looking at the permitted uses and list of prohibited uses and the outcomes, does it function more as a, a campus type use with an office campus and other uh, functionality like that? So 
I think we were a little bit between both. M and L was the one that does directly align with that I two zoning district, but uh, we may want to go back and, and look at that and see if campus is also something that would be potentially applicable there. But you're correct that it would change that community activity center place type to an M and L place type just for that parcel. So. Thank you for that, but a little further clarification. The conversation regarding the comments that I made earlier regarding actually creating areas where we're looking for industrial and office. If this were to change the place type to manufacturing and log logistics, you're saying only for this particular site, meaning that down the road, opposed to us identifying this undeveloped land that's in this area, under that place site, a residential product could potentially come before us or a different type of place site that's outside of manufacturing and logistics could be presented to council. Yeah, it, 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 and let's say on this particular site for some reason that the project doesn't move forward after the rezoning is approved and somebody says, hey, I'm gonna come back and let's build some multifamily on this parcel. We would evaluate that against the context of what's going on and if that move forward in the rezoning that would potentially change a place type from that district back to neighborhood two or another activity center depending on what they were proposing. So the place types are, are you know, set there for that guidance, but they do change as a result of rezoning if there is that inconsistency, but it doesn't mean that uh, a petition that comes in next door has to then adhere to what happened on the previous property next to it or it just gives us another kind of measure of what the context of the area is when we're evaluating future petitions or future planning efforts like the community area planning when they go out to this area they'll take a look at what uh, rezonings were approved what place type changes may have occurred particularly the big one that we just saw earlier this evening right across the road uh, and how that impacts the overall kind of character of some of that area and, and they may look at the place types that are associated with it uh, through that process. So it's it's a kind of constantly evolving type of, of uh, effort where you put in you know the current place types and then they continually get evaluated either through rezonings or through changes in area planning efforts and other factors. Okay, so Colleagues, I want us to pay attention to staff's language as far as changing the place types. When we scroll through, we will see what petitions have been approved over the last two years. So Council 2021 approved a petition for 268 multifamily. In 2020, a site plan amendment to allow multifamily residential. 2019, site plan limit amendment to allow single family attached 2019 petition to allow 20,000 square foot of I-2. While we're looking and for our amazing team that researches this, while we're looking at how we're developing, I want us to take into consideration the impact. I completely support the idea of creating more opportunities for industrial use of space. The challenge is if we're saying from the beginning that this will be changing the place type. My biggest concern is that we're saying it's only changing the place type for that site. It will be helpful and I think staff will be the one who can bring this back to us or to me. Help me understand the impact with the residential that has been approved. Has it actually been developed? What's happening with it? and what would the impact of a manufacturing and logistics place type be, mainly because we have trucks, we have movement that's going to be happening. Piedmont Natural Gas is a major partner for the city, but we also have a lot of weather challenges. So that means trucks will be going out two, three, four, five, six o'clock in the morning, coming in late, depending on what's happening in communities. I want to, want to have a better understanding that this location is one that supports a positive neighborhood environment. If we have residential so close or if it's far enough away where if there's additional manufacturing and logistics, it is not going to negatively impact environmentally sound wise the residential that is on the books to be approved or that is currently there. And I think that's between both groups we can get some information back prior to decision. 
Okay. I, I know the the northern portion from this project that they've got the 100 foot buffer and 125 foot setback that was approved for apartments. It does look like it's in for permitting. Uh, so there is multifamily development that's occurring to the north. And then I don't know of any other active projects uh, that are on this side of 485. There are some on the other side of 485, but we can certainly work with you and get you that information. Right, because, and my apologies, additional. When I look at the erosion control, the county land use, storm water, and no comments, seem like there will be some comment regarding residential and the proximity, even if it's a, it is a 100-foot buffer, of having a logistical, especially this type of facility in proximity when we look at water, sewer, and any other potential impacts. It would just be helpful to get that additional information so that we're making a decision with all the information available. Mr. Fox did, because I know I have to ask you a specific question in order for you to be able to respond. There were, uh, if you can tell me in less than a minute and a half, two minutes, there was some additional information that you were sharing at the very end of your presentation. Yeah, well, at the end was just commitments that are made. We're also contributing toward the Ryan Road widening through a 41 foot dedication of right of way along the frontage of our property. But as to your area, your concern about residential development in the area, yes, sir. there is a seven acre triangular portion of this property that will, as shown on the site plan, be undeveloped. That provides a buffer in addition to the 100 foot buffer to the residential development that's on the books for the north. And then across the street, as you just dealt with, was the industrially zone of, uh, site plan for 234 mm -hmm. that you just approved. Thank you very much. Motion to close the public hearing. Second. Any uh, uh, comments on the motion? Here are none. All in favor, close the public hearing. Hand and opposed, that's unanimous. Thank you very much. We move on to item number 30, uh, uh, rezoning petition 2022-008 by Ram Realty Acquisitions, VLLC, located on approximately 26.9 acres, located um, in the southeastern quadrant of the Steel Creek Road, inter uh, interchange with Interstate 85 and Council District 3, Ms. Watlington's district. The current zoning is R3 single family residential and a proposed zoning is N NS Neighborhood Services and Mud O, mixed use development district optional with five year vested rights. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation and site and building design. Um, we have no speakers against, so after um, staff's presentation, Mr. Carmichael will have three minutes. Mr. Patton. Okay, thank you. 2022-008 uh, is at the interchange of Steel Creek Road and I-485, uh, just across, uh, just north, excuse me, of Dixie River Road and just across from Outlets Boulevard. It's currently zoned R3. And its proposed zoning is for neighborhood services, NS, and MUD optional. They're requesting uh, some additional vested rights as well. Uh, the adopted place type from the 2040 policy map does recommend a community activity center. And the proposal is broken out into four development areas. Uh, you have development area A, which is where the NS zoning uh, would be, as well as development area B. Those are the two parcels that have their predominant frontages either along Steel Creek Road or just one parcel removed. Uh, and development area C and D uh, are proposed for mud optional. Areas A and B proposes NS uses. Uh, that could include things like accessory drive through window with menu board and or speaker box, and additional accessory drive through window without menu boards. Additionally, does propose to allow an accessory ATM drive through lane for financial services. Area C and D is where we've got our multifamily uh, that's being proposed, 375 residential dwelling units that could be either multifamily and or single family attached. Optional provisions for development area C to allow parking, vehicular circulation, and maneuvering between buildings and the structures and the I-485 setback. Uh, also requesting one year additional vesting for a total of three, so the two is standard. They're requesting one additional year. Uh, does limit building height to 70 feet and does have transportation commitments that include the extension of Rigsby Road between Steel Creek and the eastern property boundary, uh, extension of Paragon Drive between Rigsby Road and the southern property boundary, 
an eight-foot planting strip and 12-foot multi-use path along Steel Creek, and then an eight-foot planting strip and eight-foot sidewalk along all internal public streets. Also commits to a combination of windows and operable doors for a minimum of 60% of each street facing frontage that would be uh, throughout the project. Staff does recommend approval of this petition. We do have some outstanding issues for transportation and site and building design to resolve. It is consistent overall with the community activity center place type. Uh, and we'll be happy to take any questions following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John Carmichael, Rachel Krenz, Randy Goddard, and Adam McGuire. You have three minutes. Well, thank you, um, Mr. Mayor Pro Tim. Happy birthday. Members of City Council and the Zoning Committee, I'm John Carmichael. Uh, we got Rachel Russell Krenz here, Adam McGuire. Rachel's with the petitioner, Adams with land design, and Randy Goddard is here with Design Resource Group. As uh, Mr. Patton stated, the site contains about 26.9 acres. It's located on the east side of Steel Creek Road at the southeast quadrant of the I-45 Steel Creek Road interchange. Berwick, Berwick development is located to the west of the site across Steel Creek Road, as is the outlet mall. The site is currently zoned R3. To the east of the site, you've got O2CD and UR2CD zoning. To the south, you've got Neighborhood Services, UR2CD. To the west, across Steel Creek Road, you've got Commercial Center, a little bit of office zoning, and Neighborhood Services. As Mr. Petten stated, the request is to rezone the site from R3 to Neighborhood Services and Meadow to accommodate a multi-use development on the site that could be comprised of multifamily or single-family attached dwelling units and commercial uses. Uh, this is the rezoning plan. Access into the site would be provided uh, from Still Creek Road and then a future connection uh, to the south here that would ultimately collect, connect to Dixie River Road. There would also be future connectivity to the east. This site provides for and sets up for uh, nice connectivity that would benefit uh, the area. Uh, up to 375 residential dwelling units could be located in development areas D and C. Commercial uses would be located or could be located in development areas A and B. Also, a residential component could be located there as well. Among other transportation improvements, the petitioner would install a left turn lane into the site from Steel Creek Road and a right turn lane into the site from Steel Creek Road. Additionally, a 12 foot wide multi use path will be installed along the site's frontage on Steel Creek Road. Eight foot wide sidewalks will be installed along the internal streets. Architectural standards are a part of the petitioner's conditional rezoning plan. Petitioner has agreed to dedicate one acre of the site to the county for a future park. The petitioner's met numerous times with the Steel Creek Residents Association to discuss the rezoning request, and we appreciate the time that they provided to the petitioner. Uh, as Mr. Payton stated, the uh, plan staff has determined that the proposal is consistent with the 2040 policy map, and we appreciate their uh, recommendation of approval. And we will work to or will resolve the uh, remaining outstanding issues this week uh, through a revised site plan that will be filed no later than Thursday. And we're happy to answer your questions. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Uh, any discussion from the council? Motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Any discussion on that motion after seconding? Second. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed? That is unanimous. Thank Moving you. on to item 31, petition number. Number 2022-077 by Blue Ocean for approximately 3.64 acres uh, located on the north side of <clears throat> Yorkmont Road, west of Tyvola Road, and south of Oak Lake Boulevard, Council District 3, Ms. Watlington's district. Current zoning is I-1 Air Light Industrial Airport with, with the airport noise overlay, um, and the proposed zoning is Mud O Air Mixed-Use Development District Optional the airport noise overlay. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to site and building design. Um, there are no speakers in opposition, so after uh, staff's presentation, the petition will have three minutes. Mr. Patton. All right, thank you. 2022 077, uh, it's 3.64 acres on Yorkmont Road. It is currently zoned I 1. And the proposed, or excuse me, adopted place type is innovation mixed use. And the proposal is to accommodate the adaptive reuse of a hotel building with the option to convert to multifamily residential units. Uh, would maintain the ability to use the building as a hotel. Uh, does match the number of existing and proposed hotel rooms and multifamily units at 103. Does limit building height to the existing height of the structure at 46 feet. 
Uh, optional provisions are requested to keep the existing parking and maneuvering between the existing building and street while not allowing uh, additional nonconformity. So essentially you can increase that degree of nonconformity on the site. Uh, does commit to installing eight foot planting strip and eight foot sidewalk along York Mott Road. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition due to some outstanding issues for site and building design to be resolved. Uh, it is overall consistent with the 2040 policy map recommendation for innovation mixed use, uh, which does allow for residential uses. Uh, and we'll be happy to take any questions following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. You have three minutes. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members, Colin Brown, on behalf of the Petitioner Blue Ocean. The Blue Ocean team is here. Uh, if you have questions, uh, this is a very well-located property, uh, as you can see from this aerial. Uh, good proximity to airport, plenty of logistics jobs, as well as office jobs, and some retail amenities in the area. Uh, this is an extended stay hotel that's got some age on it. As you know, um, some extended ho stay hotels are essentially becoming housing uh, for some in our community. This is an opportunity to, to convert this into real long-term housing. The zoning will allow us to convert this to 103 residential uses uh, in the existing building. Uh, what's positive here, I know that we've had some hotels that have been sold and residents have been displaced. Uh, Blue Ocean's model, they, and they've done this around the country, takes that into consideration. Uh, they have folks here that are, that are virtually their tenants uh, that they would like to move into long-term, more sustainable housing. Perfectly, this building really breaks down into two buildings. And so it's possible when the work is done, conversion work starts on one side of the building. Uh, they can, folks can be relocated to the other and folks that want to be there long-term can stay on property and then move into a completed unit when they're finished. Um, really, this is not involving major changes. It is very much an adaptive reuse and a refresh of a good building in a good area to provide some, really some naturally occurring affordable housing. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Mrs. Johnson. Thank you. So I'm raising the red flag. Um, I remember when, it might have been the last one was developed, um, we asked that that developer meet with the t tenants or occupants of the hotel and develop a plan and the plan was essentially, there's a deficit of resources. That's basically what we heard. There's a deficit of affordable resources. And the, on the last day, folks ended up displaced. So I, I'm, I know, I believe we as a council need to be very intentional about developing policies. When developers are buying hotels, we are seeing more of these. And, you know, every, you know the, the, the first time it happened, it, it wasn't a council decision, but the second, another time that it did, it was a direct council decision that displaced folks. So um, I said it then, I'm gonna say it again. We have to have a policy. City staff, we need to be uh, very intentional. Um, the public needs to know that there is a uh, rezoning petition at one of the, the hotels or motels near the airport, so it's not a surprise. Um, one of the things we talked about before, if there were uh, maybe a more clear sign for the hotel occupants, this, this hotel is being sold or something. But we need the housing advocates to be uh, aware and engaged in this petition, um, 202077 and the uh in this hotel at tyvola and oak lake boulevard that it's for sale and developers are looking at it we cannot allow any more residents to be surprised by the sale of a hotel um and, and councils making the decision i understand developers uh, the, the, you know open market and all of that but each time that this has happened then it's you know in the news afterwards that people are being displaced and we cannot act like we're going to be surprised again. Yeah. And so um, and so I, I just I'm raising the red flag. Council, we need to develop a policy, an anti-displacement policy, a community benefits policy. I recognize that developers, uh, you know, can can buy land and and then we we don't control that, but we have a direct responsibility for our residents uh, because each time you know we are reacting it's it's time for us to really look at some proactive solutions um, before this is 
decided on if it's approved. Yeah, and, and so to be clear, uh, Blue Ocean does own the hotel. They, they own the hotel as it is. Their goal is to house those residents, right? This is not that this site is going away, being scraped, and it's becoming something else, that this would turn into long-term housing for those residents. Uh, Mr. Petten actually raised that issue with us and said we should, we should work with Housing Neighborhood Development to make sure that's communicated, and we're happy to do that. So I'll interact with them. I, I understand. I understand. And, and it's bigger than Blue Ocean. You know, it, we, we have, as council, need to be engaged and residents need to know that this hotel's for, for sale and things will change. And the housing advocates need to be aware of this also. So it's not a surprise in, you know, in four months or whenever and people are being displaced. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think this, um, um, I'm going to ask Ms. Penn a question, but I think what, what I hear Ms. Johnson raising, she asked for a policy discussion um, specifically around um, people uh, displaced um, by hotel redevelopment. And I know um, uh, this is a, a, a goal in some places to replace hotels, motels, um, because of um, uh, some of the things that occur in and around those hotels in those neighborhoods. So mm -hmm. I think uh, staff, we should learn, um, consider how we might have that policy discussion in general. Um, but Mr. Pat, and I, I would ask, um, given what Blue Ocean has said um, through, through Mr. Brown, um, and, and thank you for your question and raising that at the very beginning, how would something like that um, be um, held accountable in a land use plan? Um, in, in, in this case, but they said they want they want to prioritize that. So how would we kind of get that in writing? That would probably be I would think that would be an, an arrangement that would be made outside of the zoning document because it's the zoning document has to be enforceable from a zoning code enforcement perspective, which I don't know if we can really go out and enforce uh, communication or retention of, of tenants, like those are things that can certainly be agreed upon outside of the zoning document. It can certainly be something that gets inquired to is whether or not that's been uh, something in place prior to a decision. I don't know if it would live in the zoning document that we would approve, but it could be either some type of third party agreement or agreement between uh, a nonprofit organization in Blue Ocean, uh, but it likely wouldn't be a scenario that we would incorporate into a zoning document other than there would be good faith efforts to collaborate with those groups to uh, achieve that outcome. Thank you very much. Make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Discussion about that motion. Here are none. All in favor, close the public hearing. Re please raise your hand. Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. We will move on to item number 32, uh, rezoning petition 2022-082 by uh, Maple Multifamily Land SE uh, LP, located on approximately 13.26 acres on the south side of West Mallard Creek uh, Church Road, east of I-85 and north of Berkeley Place Drive in Council District 4, Ms. Johnson's District. The current zoning is R43 multifamily residential and R3 single family residential, and the proposed zoning is UR2 urban residential conditional. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation and requested technical revisions related to site design. Um, there are no speakers again, so after Mr. Petten's um, uh, after Mr. Patton's presentation, the petition will have three minutes. Mr. Patton. All right. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. 2022 13 and a quarter acres off West Mallard Creek Church Road, just at the interchange of uh, I-85 and West Mallard Creek Church. Currently zoned R3. There's a very small portion of R43 MF on the back of the property. Uh, the proposed zoning is for UR2 conditional and the adopted place type does call for neighborhood one. We can certainly uh, have the, some of that conversation following uh, all the presentations here. Uh, the proposal is for up to 305 multifamily dwelling units, does limit maximum building height to six wide planting strip and 12 foot wide multi-use path uh, along the site's frontage of West Mallard Creek Church Road, does commit to also extending the existing Wright Hill Road, which is just there to the south 
uh, with a connection to Mallard Creek Church Road. That would also include six foot sidewalks and an eight foot planting strip should that road be extended. Also provides an ADA compliant bus stop that would be coordinated with CATS. Uh, would commit to providing an outdoor amenity area and or common open space areas, which would include a minimum of at least two of things such as a clubhouse, hardscape, softscape, pool, cabana, benches, seating, landscaping, etc. cetera. Uh, also provides architectural standards to include things like building materials, a uh, uh, blank wall, uh, massing, and other uh, architectural standards we typically see for our multifamily projects. Uh, staff does recommend approval of the petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation and technical revisions related to site design. Uh, it is inconsistent with that neighborhood one place type, uh, but we'll be happy to take any questions and, and talk through those uh, following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Brown, you have three minutes. Thank you, um, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members Colin Brown. On behalf of the petitioner, um, with me tonight, uh, Mark Matthews and Emily White. Um, on, from the petitioner team if you have questions for them. As Dave mentioned, uh, this is, again, a well-located property. Um, if you can see here, here's my, here's my big star. The challenge for this on us, and I, I hear Ms. Um, Mayfield's comments earlier about the frustrations with the inconsistencies, they're certainly frustrating to us. Uh, but if you'll see, this is 13 acres on 85 and Mallard Creek Church. Um, we have some frustrations with the policy map as well. If you can see the map I have on the screen right now, uh, the issue for us is this is an interchange. It is surrounded entirely by much heavier uses. The 2040 map, I think, recommends a neighborhood one because that's what the current zoning was. But it literally makes zero sense for this to be a low density residential site. Uh, so these are some challenges that we're running into with the 2040 plan where you see some outliers like this. Because it had R3 zoning, that's what the plan gave it. You know, when you look at this and look at everything around it, that, that really doesn't make much sense. So I hate to be inconsistent, but we, we think it's a good plan and I appreciate staff kind of reading through that, looking at the context and being supportive. Um, so again, the proposal for 305 units here, uh, working closely with CDOT on some infrastructure improvements to provide some street connectivity. Uh, we currently are showing an access point uh, out to Mallard Creek here but are working with CDOT and adjacent property owner to see if we can't square that up um, with another access point across the street. Uh, so I think it's positive. I, again, we're a little frustrated that we're not more consistent with the 2040 plan given where this property is at a major interstate interchange and surrounded by much higher intensity units. Um, happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I would mention that um, the current place type map is a translation of the status quo. Um, it, it, it does not um, reflect uh, the, uh, the future intent uh, or desires of where we think it should be going. We are entering the community area planning process uh, where we will um, um, map um, um, hopefully more appropriate uh, future uses uh, through community-led and community-driven um, um, processes. This is why um, we are seeing a lot of inconsistencies um, uh, 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 with, with place types, um, and it is expected it is an awkward place that we are all in um, as it relates to the plot process, again, of becoming a plan-oriented city. Um, Ms. Watlington? Yeah, I did want to just touch on that a little bit. Um, and specific to this uh, parcel, and particularly because uh, you, Mr. Brown, are standing there at the podium. I know that you and I have worked on several things. You and Brittany and I have worked on several petitions in which we've been able to um, engage the residents to come up with some creative solutions. And so I do just want to say this is an example, like you mentioned, of a time where a plan that sounds good on paper uh, may not necessarily translate in reality. And so I do think that there is a place for community engagement in every one of these rezonings because rezonings by definition are exceptions to the rule. And I think that there's absolutely a place for that. And I just want to commend you all for your work in, um, in leading those discussions and incorporating the needs of the community into those plans that would not otherwise be there. Um, that said, as it relates to this one, um, Going forward after the UDO, uh, or not after the UDO, excuse me, after the area plans, are you anticipating that this would not have been something that you that would have been taken care of in that process? 
Well, and I'll let Dave speak to this, but this isn't just the zoning translation map. This is the 2040 policy map, okay. which is going to guide some of that. Okay. And I mean, y'all look at it too. There's not a bit of single family around it. Um, so I, I, I don't know. Maybe that would be updated. Uh, I would hope it would. If when someone starts to look at this on a case by case basis, someone would look at that context and say, well, that that should not be neighborhood one. He's looking at you. I didn't know if you had something else to add. I can feel him. I can feel him looking at me. <laughs> I try not to look over. Um, I, I, I think, you know, generally speaking, particularly for this parcel, one of the things that we kind of do understand about the policy map, uh, these out, uh, I, I would call them large uh, kind of estate lots that are zoned residential, R3, R4, have a single, you know, set family structure on, you know, a lot that's over an acre or more in size. And that, a lot of that was captured in the methodology for putting the policy map together uh, that then translated that to maintain that neighborhood one characteristic. But, you know, as we look at this, either through the lens of rezoning or through the lens of community area planning, you know, kind of items like this will certainly get looked at with more scrutiny to say, okay, this is what, it was on that original map and through the original methodology, but do we now need to update that based on what we know, what we know about any changing context? This rezoning, should it be approved, would automatically update this parcel, but that would then, like the gap that's between the two commercial on the other side of West Mallard Creek Church on the north side, you know, would we take a look at that and say, does it make sense for that to be neighborhood one? So it'll still get, uh, looked at and refined. That's what the community area planning process is geared to do. Uh, so I, I would expect some things to be uh, further reviewed and, and analyzed and potentially changed as a result of that. Uh, but this gives us a good starting point. Okay, thank you. And then just one last follow up. Um, just so I'm clear, when these place types on these parcels are changed going forward. When we think about some of the things we've discussed here earlier in the session about affordable housing, about infrastructure, those kinds of things, where what is incumbent upon a buy right developer to then do? Where is that captured somewhere? Or are those things things that would just otherwise not occur? Yeah, so there are some elements of that built in similar to how we have now with TOD with bonus structure where you want to exceed height or other aspects of your project, there are bonus uh, items that can be used to achieve that, one of which is contribution to affordable housing, other is, you know, things like LEED certified, certified buildings, electric charging stations, et cetera. All of that's been built into the UDO for certain districts in the activity centers. So not as much geared into like the neighborhood one and two part of things, but in those areas we expect more intense development. That bonus structure is now in place for those types of projects. And we've started to use that as a guiding point for us a little bit as we look at rezonings, particularly those that are gonna be uh, getting up for consideration closer to the effective date. Uh, knowing that we have those tools, we'll start to see those get used either by right or incorporated into rezonings, but that does give us uh, a little bit more use of the tool that we've already kind of seen some success with in TOD, uh, but we'll see that more across the board in the activity center place types. Okay, that's something that as we continue down this path, I think is particularly important um, because those are the things that we wanna make sure are incorporated in our processes. Um, if we're going to move away from uh, the kind of one-off discussions, it needs to, our minimum baseline needs to be inclusive of the kinds of things that we need in all types of parcels as we go forward. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Ms. Johnson. Yes, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. My question is for staff. Um, and I've, I've been talking to Dave for the last couple months about all of the development mm -hmm. in the Mallard Creek area. So it's for staff, but also for my colleagues. You, you know, I've, I've talked about the cumulative impact mm -hmm. of growth, and we had the infrastructure meeting on 1219. I want to bring an example to you. So our residents talk about the overcrowding and everything, but when we look at these petitions, we look at them singularly. And this is just a, a great example that, uh, and Dave, if you can help me or help us to really make more responsible and strategic decisions. So when, on page six of seven of this rezoning, it looks like there are two uh, petitions that are nearby, right? Mm -hmm. So I just sent a map to to Liz and to Dave. If you can show that map 
of the pending and approved rezonings in this Mallard Creek um, area. And this is what we hear from the residents. And um, I, so I, I don't. And, and I also want to ask about the school numbers oh. in reference to these maps. If I can get either yeah, that we're, or we're the we're working to pull that up, up right now. And correct me where I'm wrong. If in our petition, um, there are two petitions that are listed, but according to the map, I think there were. Do you have the map in front of you? Let's see. Hold on, it's coming. Yeah, we're we're just working to get it up on okay. the on the screen. Apologies for the delay. Those that are watching, we're working to get something pulled up, um, a document that Ms. Johnson is, is referencing. Thank you. So what happens, again, council is given uh, these petitions, and there's all this growth that's happening that we are not looking at from a cumulative impact. And this is the Mallard Creek quadrant. And, I don't, and I've sent this to uh, Prosperity Village uh, president, I, I mean, I've we need some help um, from city staff. So if you look at that, I, I can't tell how many there are. There's, there's more than two. Mm -hmm. And um, this, is the, this is what the residents are talking about. I don't know how we can review these cumulatively. And I want to give one example for this petition, and I have agreed also that the petition we're looking at right now, the 20. 22082, and I've talked to the developers about this as well. Looks like this is going to increase Stony Creek Elementary from 121% to 123%. Um, if you can pull up the, the chart, Dave, that I've also been working with you on, there are 2022 petitions with the same numbers and that have been approved. So when do we start to change this per percentage for the school overcrowding and start to review it from a cumulative perspective or an ongoing perspective? And this is why we, you know, uh, Council Member uh, Bakari and I both, both pushed for the infrastructure and led that, that infrastructure discussion because this is what's happening all around us in the city. But yet when we see these petitions, you know, we can only review them from a, a siloed approach. Meanwhile, our residents are saying, hey, this is happening, listen to us. Mm -hmm. So we have to have a tool where we can measure the, this growth responsibly. So I, I, the, the map you all saw, in our, in our zoning book, there were two petitions, but they were like, I don't know, 11 or 12 mm -hmm. with thousands and thousands of trips. This you probably can't, can't see, but there's um, active and also approved petitions. Stony Creek, if you, if you pull that Stony Creek on that one, was approved, is that January 2022? And the numbers are Stony Creek, it's at the top. Yep. 2021, 148, approved in January. The numbers then were um, to 123 percent, I think, Stony Creek. And then there are more, if you scroll down, that reference Stony Creek specifically, 110 to 111. Mm -hmm. And then today's petition says 121 to 123. I thought there was 121, 123 on one of these as well. So. How are we able, oh, there it is at the bottom, to 123% in May of 2021. So, and then that's just the approved page. There's a pending page as well. How are we truly, truly capturing the growth? And, I, and you know, please don't think of this just schools, because I know we're not CMS. But it's the infrastructure comprehensively. So. I just need help. And, and when you look at that map with all that growth in Mallard Creek, um, 
Mm. I just want to approve these responsibly. I want to listen to my resident, to our residents, but I need the right tools. Mm. And that's my question. That's my comment. Yeah, I mean, as far as the CMS question goes, that's certainly, I think, a question that they're best equipped to try to field how they factor these into capital planning and other elements of, of their efforts. I, I know they're a bit challenged in a sense of their capital plans are more based on where they have need versus where they anticipate uh, but need. I, and so I, I, but again, they're probably the best group to maybe come in and mm -hmm. share some of that insight and information with mm -hmm. y'all, and Jesus. we'd be happy to kind of set that up. But I don't know if we're the best equipped to answer that uh, other than just a little bit of information we know from coordinating on these um, rezonings with them over the last you know, many years. But we are making the decision for the growth. We know that we're 50 out of 50 in upward mobility and failing in overcrowded schools leads to that. So it's not just the school and I don't want to get stuck in, in, you know, we're not responsible for the schools. This, this is in, in reference to our stormwater, mm -hmm. transportation, mm -hmm. traffic. If we are not looking at these comprehensively, then we as a council are not making truly informed decisions. That it, Ms. Johnson? Yes, thank Ms. you. Ms. Ashmira? Yes, so I hear what Ms. Johnson is saying. She's looking at it from the infrastructure perspective, which really falls under our purview, especially roads, bike lanes, sidewalks. Uh, and I know there is an infrastructure gap here. Uh, I remember there were several changes David, that we had made where now we actually have rezonings, recent rezonings that were approved as part of our workbook. Um, and however, that doesn't include this additional information that is being provided here. This is powerful, by the way, Ms. Johnson, because this really shows a bigger picture of a pressing demand on our infrastructure. Um, that may not be factored into our traffic count yet because some of this is still under uh, construction or in the pipeline. So is there a way where we can see sort of a future state that this is what the demand will be in a year down the road or two years down the road? Uh, and I think is that might help to Ms. Johnson's point, point to really look at it from a sort of a big picture and not just make decision one petition at a time because uh, I mean this is I didn't know we had that many rezonings approved just in that area alone there's, um, there's one tab for approved one for pending this yeah is Mallow so, Creek alone so this is approved tab or this is a pending tab I don't know they have to uh, yeah was... but either way I, I think you get the point here but I uh, in our zoning notebook, there were several changes that were made uh, since 2017 uh, where we now include what's been recently approved. But I think it would be helpful to include some of that information because we don't have that in our package. Okay. And, and let me just add, in our book, there are two petitions that show approved. So yeah. So we are getting that information, but there are two that are listed. Yeah, so I don't know we, what the difference between think, these two and those and the other ones. Yeah, I don't think we zoom out as far on those that we typically tend to just stay within probably about a mile or half mile of the site on some of those uh, petitions that are still, or that have been either active or approved over the last five years from this one and your uh, staff analyses. Okay. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. I think the future state is what Ms. Johnson is asking for. Yep. I think providing that information might just help uh, mm -hmm. understand, even like from the capital uh, improvement perspective, um, I don't know how CDOT and then other, plan other agencies are planning their capital needs project, but do they actually look at future state or do they only look at current demand? 
Because I think uh, we do need to look at future state here as, as more rezonings are approved uh, or in the pipeline because that clearly shows there is certainly more demand on infrastructure that's coming so that we are not really creating traffic and congestion issues. So maybe that might be a question for our CDOT and... As CDOT is coming up, I would just say um, these are questions that have been brought up um, during that that infrastructure conversation and uh, staff is working and staff is working on getting better um, uh, better more effective ways of presenting this information in, in our zoning zoning um, decisions yeah. and typically capital planning projects will look at long long-term horizons and so this types of information would be included when looking at what types of improvements are needed from a capital perspective um, and then on a, on a more micro perspective, when we do traffic studies for development uh, petitions, uh, we'll look at shorter time frames uh, uh, for, for those that might be more five to ten years out or, or shorter, depending on what type of study is needed. So what tool are you all using to look at the current and future state? Is there a tool that council can also access to, to really get a... a sort of big picture? Uh, that, that's a tough question. F from, a, from a capital perspective, there's a regional model which looks at traffic volumes out 20 years. Um, but it's, it's, it's complicated and not something that's usually um, you know, dispersed. And it, it doesn't get down necessarily to micro levels a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. um, and then for, um, for a tool for this type of work, it's you know it's just the data within these traffic studies. We don't have projections for every street, um, you know, based on how development's occurring in each segment. Um, but it is captured within the traffic studies that that we do, and we have general projections on on traffic within those. So it looks like you're looking at it at much more granular level than just the zonings. Obviously, traffic pattern and. Um, the use and and this is actually this um, this location is a good example of how we accomplish um, looking at this we have a large traffic study going on for a separate rezoning that's across on the north side uh, of, of this road um, and and even though that that traffic study does not consider this specific development um, it does use a growth rate to capture what this development will generate in the future. And so that's how we capture uh, maybe these smaller sites that don't generate the need for their own study, uh, but we capture them in other uh, larger studies throughout the area. Uh, and, and so they're not, maybe the trips aren't specifically tied, but approximately they're represented in those other studies that we do to make sure when we uh, look at what infrastructure improvements are needed from a development perspective that that's captured. Yeah, that is very helpful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Ms. Mayfield. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. We're just going to let you stand there and be decorative. Here's the <laughs> question for staff. So when I'm looking at this, and Councilmember Perkins Johnson, thank you for what you identified. We have opportunity to really reach out to our partners with CMS to try to get us on the same page of what we're looking at. But I'm also looking at the vehicle trip generation. So every time we get this submitted, it's some, and this is a question, is it submitted based on each individual project or are we looking at it as a, an accumulative since we know that we've approved other projects in that area? So that proposed 1,400 trips a day if the entitlement is only 425, but we've approved other developments in that immediate area, help me understand how we're reconciling that. So it's the trips are generated or that are looked at for the vehicle trip generations just from this site. So it's just the 325 apartments I think they're proposing. Is it? Three? Okay, so let's just. So 305 apartments then generate that. 1400 trips that you see in the trip gen calculation. So when we think about that, and this is something we as a body can look at as well when we think about infrastructure. Once they leave out this complex and they get back onto West Mallet Creek, that's backing up traffic. So when you add in 
seem to me, just as a layperson, if I'm looking at Trump generation, I'm, I would be looking at Trump generation on Mallet Creek, not going into this facility. Because the challenge is going to be them turning in or attempting to get out in the mornings, in the afternoons, in the evening if we have backup in this area. Now, we have in here, in our paperwork, Charlotte Water has accessible water system infrastructure for the rezoning boundary via an existing 24-inch water distribution mains located at West Mallet Creek Church Road. Charlotte Water currently does not have sewer system accessibility for the rezoning boundary under review. The closest available sewer main is approximately 425 feet northeast of the rezoning boundary on Mallet Glen Drive. Explain that to me in layman's terms. If, again, if we have multiple projects that we have already approved that are coming and that's going to need to tap into not only water but sewer and the discussion that we're having with this proposal and access to sewer. So there's sewer in the area. They just need to privately invest in extending those lines on their own, those additional 425 feet to bring it to the site to then be served with, uh, with sewer. So, so there is sewer in the area. It's just not located on the site. So then the developer has the expense of bringing that sewer line to the site so they can connect to the system. So when Charlotte Water states that it currently does not have sewer system accessibility for the rezoning boundary, under review, we have identified that the other projects have access to sewer. This particular project right now doesn't, and in order for it to get access to sewer, they will have to privately pay for the additional concrete that we're going to need to bring to give them access to tap into Charlotte sewer system. Yeah, the, the developer would be taking on the expense of extending the lines to connect to the city system. Okay, I actually do have a question for our petitioner. So we have in here that the maximum building height, there are limits of up to the 65 feet and to allow up to 305 multifamily dwelling. And this is something we can follow up with later to find out if there is any potential wiggle room in the reduction of that number of 305 based on the infrastructure needs and the impact that we have in the area with that. Because we know a number of us like driving our vehicles. I'm a big fan of my vehicle. But we also know we need public transportation access. With the way Mallet Creek, West Mallet Creek currently is set up, the impact of all of this new development, including if this development were to move forward in its current state of traffic and impact of traffic and lack of access to public transportation, just want to check if you can check in with your clients to see if there's any wiggle room on possibly reducing that number from the 305. You know, they're here at the meeting tonight. We'll be happy to follow up with you on it. I mean, the, the answer is the, the people, are, people are coming to Charlotte. Um, and, and, and this is an example of a site where they're right there by the interstate, and we don't have to drive them through eight lights to get out to the interstate. And they can actually walk to some mixed-use development. So, but happy to have the conversation. I just think that's the set. The, the people are coming. It's, I think, our goal. And, and you all said it well, is we've got to... Are we making strategic decisions to put them in the right places? And I would agree that people are coming. I'm also concerned about the people that are already here. So the residents, like, we have been in this city for decades. So what we have paid in taxes have helped to contribute to this growth. The challenge is a lot of our residents who have been here and who have contributed are not the ones who are able to take advantage of some of these products. The market is the market. We don't have a lot of control over that. But what we do have is a model that's out there. South Park alone has a model where three different developers went in and they created an opportunity with no governmental subsidies or support. They made a conscious decision to create something that was accessible to different levels of our workforce. The model is out there. It is about how do we be good stewards with development 
and not just thinking about those who might come, but think about what are we doing to protect and create opportunities for the residents who are already here. A number of people that are in here, your children are back home from college or they just graduated. Where do they go if they want to stay in our city for us to have the talent and to help them have access to something that is attainable, that's accessible, that gives access to a greater quality of life and that overwhelmingly and most importantly is affordable. Regardless of what that affordability level is, it needs to be diverse enough so our workers can go there. Because if you go in, get up and go into a job, you're a worker. Some workers make a little more than others, but are we creating a space for our workforce to live within our city limits? That's just something I would like for them to consider. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Can you pull the map back up? I just want that visual, right? So um, I wanted to piggyback off what Council Member Mayfield said. You mentioned the stormwater. So I, I understand, but, but I've gone out to several residents' homes whose yards are flooding in District 4 uh, because of the impact on the, the pipes. So uh, we, we just know that these are issues this growth is an issue, and we just have to be more responsible. Another thing Councilmember Mayfield mentioned was the children, children who are home from school. It's not just recent college graduates who can't afford to, to buy a home here in Charlotte. What did we learn last week? Uh, only, uh, you know, the, the numbers, 10%, 10 percent, yeah, 10 percent are able to afford what is it they afford the houses or minimum $68,000. Yeah, passing. so so we know. We know there's a crisis, and I just think it's we really have to keep this kind of stuff in front of us. We need the tools to be able to really make informed decision. We have two rezonings in our book. If we were to look at this, however, there are all these that are pending and, and approved in 2021. The numbers aren't, aren't really changing, um, and, and we just – I've been saying it um, for two – more than two years, cumulative impact. I ran on strategic and responsible development. So I, I, I've been asking the same questions, and we have to, um, to just do a better job for our residents. The, the residents of Mallard Creek, um, you know, I, I, I don't even, I don't know what we're going to do. I need the information to make it, the decisions on any of these petitions. <coughs> so we talked about attainable, um, numbers or what or what is a realistic uh, amount of growth traffic all of that I've asked our planning um, manager before when does the city know when they've reached that plateau is it crime is it traffic is it is it lack of affordability are, are, are we there so uh, I, I just we just really need the proper tools thank you move to close second, second. Motion to close the public hearing and properly, properly second. Any discussion on that motion? Hear none. All in favor, close the public hearing. Raise your hand. Any opposed? That's unanimous. Um, moving on to item number 33, uh, rezoning petition number 2022-087 by Appaloosa Real Estate Partners, located on approximately 11.65 acres, located on the east side of Mallet Creek Road, north of Governor Hunt Road, and west of David Taylor Drive, in Council District 4, Ms. Johnson's District. Uh, the current zoning is R3, single-family residential. The proposed zoning is UR2, urban residential uh, conditional. Staff recommends approval of this petition uh, upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation. There are no speakers against this petition, so after staff's presentation, uh, Ms. Grant, uh, you will have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, 2022-087, that's on Mallard Creek Road, it's 11.65 acres. That's uh, just uh, to the west of David Taylor Drive and north of Governor Hunt Road. It's currently zoned R3 and its proposed zoning is UR2. You can see some UR2 existing in the area and then of course the research zoning uh, back there on David Taylor 
thrive or that large uh, employment center uh, in the University City. Uh, the adopted place type is for neighborhood one, uh, and the proposal itself is for up to 283 multifamily dwelling units, uh, eight foot planning strip, 12 foot multi-use path along Mallard Creek Road, 50 feet of right of way dedicated from the center line of Mallard Creek Road as well, uh, does provide access to the southern portion of the site through right in, right out, uh, and then access on the northern site at Colvard Park Way will be a full movement intersection, so that will align uh, with that road across the street does provide an ADA compliant bus stop on Mallard Creek Road as well, be coordinated with CATS and permitting. Uh, also commits to a 50 foot Class C buffer for uh, single family lots that are adjacent and then provides 5,000 square feet of improved open space uh, with uh, three amenity elements, also provides architectural standards uh, and also walkways to connect all residential entrances to sidewalks along public and private streets. Uh, staff is recommending approval upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation. Uh, it is inconsistent with that neighborhood one policy map. Uh, I will say it's likely a similar scenario as what we looked at on the last one where you had some R3 uh, single family zoning with large lot uh, housing which maintained that neighborhood one place type, but we have seen uh, significant development in this corridor, particularly driven by enhancements to the research park and just the overall uh, intensification of some of these lots along Mallard Creek Road. Uh, so this is a, a continuation of some of that trend and we'll be happy to take any questions following uh, the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Ms. Grant. You have three minutes. Good evening and happy birthday, Mayor Pro Tem. Bridget Grant with Moore and Van Allen here in, on behalf of the petitioner, Appaloosa Real Estate Partners. Uh, we were listening closely to the last petition, and so I'm just going to breeze through some of these context slides and talk a little bit about the investment in infrastructure. It's an 11.65 acre site, as you mentioned, on West Mallard Creek Road. The site is surrounded um, with other R3 uses that have recently been converting over to more intense and dense uses. While we recognize it's inconsistent with the adopted land use policy, we also want to point out that it's on a major thoroughfare, what makes it appropriate for more intense uses rather than some of the single family uses. We also understand and recognize that this is providing support for the increasing housing opportunities, providing higher level design standards through that conditional zoning process. We're creating housing opportunities that are in very close proximity to offices and jobs, directly across the street from Mallard Creek Elementary School, directly across the street from the Clarks Creek Greenway. We're providing a 12-foot multi-use path along the site that will ultimately connect to bike lanes that are on Governor Hunt. So you can see that this is a lot of infrastructure um, building on some of the things that are already there. We're building on existing multi-use paths. We're building and connecting to bike lanes. We're providing additional street connections. We're making the improvements that are required by NCDOT to the site. And we have been listening to everything you said tonight, so we're happy to explore the conversation on infrastructure needs and investment further after this evening. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Um, ditto. So, <laughs> so I, just, um, I just wanted to bring to the attention the, the trips per day. It's, it's uh, 13.05 trips per day. We don't do a traffic study unless there are at least 2,500 trips per day. But you saw from the previous graph um, how many were less than 2,500 trips per day, but yet there's a cumulative impact on the residents. Um, another thing I just wanted to, uh, the previous graph, I think the school, the, um, the impact on school, the numbers are about the same. Um, when you talk about Mallard Creek Elementary, uh, it says 76 to 78 percent. But I'm looking at my, my old graph. I believe those were the same numbers cited um, last year or maybe 2021. And if I recall correctly, Mallard Creek Elementary has the, the modules outside. So, um, yeah. I'm just really concerned about the, the level of, uh, of growth without the infrastructure um, keeping up with the growth in this area, the entire city, but, but this area and in District 4 overall. Thank you. We'll close. Second. Second. Motion has been made. Properly seconds. Close public hearing. Any uh, discussion? Hearing none. All in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Any opposition, please raise your hand. Um, that is unanimous. We move on to item number 34, uh, petition, rezoning petition 
number 2022-093 by ZCM B1 LLC, uh, located on approximately 1.56 acres on the north side of Gondola Avenue, east of West Sugar Creek Road, and north of Cinderella Road in Council District 1, Ms. Anderson's district. The current zoning is R4 single family residential, and the proposed zoning is UR1CD urban residential conditional. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to site and building design and transportation. Uh, there is opposition, community opposition to this petition. Uh, so after um, uh, Mr. Petton's uh, presentation, the petitioner will have 10 minutes to present. All right, thank you, 2022-093. It's uh, just about one and a half acres off Gondola Ave, uh, east of West Sugar Creek Road and north of Cinderella Road. Uh, it is currently zoned R4, and the proposed zoning is UR1 conditional. Adopted place type is neighborhood one. You can see some neighborhood center along West Sugar Creek Road and then neighborhood two just to the south of the existing uh, multifamily uh, units are. Uh, this proposal would allow up to 14 lots along uh, an extension of Gondola Avenue. Uh, those would be uh, duplex dwelling units or single family detached homes. You can see those lots laid out uh, on that site plan in front of you. Uh, does provide a 20 foot setback measured from back of curb, uh, as well as a 20 foot garage setback behind the sidewalk. Architectural standards uh, in relation to building materials, blank walls, garage setbacks, uh, garage door treatments and usable porches have been incorporated into the conditional notes. Uh, it would extend Gondola Avenue to the west, uh, to the western property line and then construct an eight foot planning strip and six foot sidewalk along the north side of that extended road. Uh, would also install a temporary turnaround at the end of the street uh, that would provide for fire access until uh, any further extension of the street is uh, undertaken. Also provides a five foot temporary sidewalk west of the site connecting to a uh, sidewalk off West Sugar Creek. If uh, the adjacent property owner would agree to that, that would provide some pedestrian connectivity uh, back over to West Sugar Creek Road. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition. We do have issues related to site and building design and transportation to be resolved. It is consistent with uh, the 2040 policy map recommendation for neighborhood one, and we will turn it over to the petitioner and the public and take any questions you have after that. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much, uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, you have 10 minutes. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members, Colin Brown on behalf, on behalf of the petitioner. Uh, thanks, Dave, for the overview and Brittany for fetching me from the lobby. Sorry, that case went faster than I expected. Um, so of course, this uh, property is on the edge of Hidden Valley. Uh, we've had some um, initial community meetings with the neighborhood. I did receive a letter um, from Ms. Parker over uh, uh, prior to the weekend uh, with some feedback from Hidden Valley. We prepare, are prepared to uh, be at their neighborhood meeting on the 17th. Uh, you know, a little bit of challenge on the site. One of uh, the recommendations from the neighborhood was that this become, you know, could we look at doing single family? Uh, and that's a challenge we're having throughout Charlotte. Um, and, and in Hidden Valley neighborhood, it's, it's tough. I think we're trying to, we're really walking a fine line. I think we get some uh, feedback from the neighborhood uh, that we don't want houses prices too high, you know, causing gentrification. Uh, others that, that do want some, some property uh, valuation appreciation. So I think it is difficult um, to find the right mix uh, what you will see, and we've talked about this translation, uh, this is an area that will translate to N1B automatically uh, in June, and there would be an opportunity for someone to build attached housing. Uh, we've talked a lot about missing middle, um, and I've talked, I, I, we've had this conversation a lot, and I think uh, a lot of council members have said, well, why can't y'all come in and do duplex units? And so this is a local development team looking to come in and do duplex units, uh, trying to make them as attainably priced as possible. And so this is the site plan you see before you. Again, I think come June, someone could develop these as, as duplex units. Uh, one of the positives is we're still in a conditional zoning environment, uh, so we can continue to have conversations with you all, as well as the neighborhood association, and see if we can uh, add some conditions uh, that would get them comfortable. Um, so th that's it fairly simply. Uh, infill site here makes a lot of sense uh, to add some housing, uh, obviously discussion over what type of housing type. Uh, if a Again, I think zoning come June will automatically allow attached housing here. Uh, so I don't know if anyone would do single family homes. Uh, if they would, I think you probably all know with the cost of land uh, and price of construction, single family homes would certainly be unattainable. 
uh, we hope uh, that we can make some progress with conversations with the community. Uh, there are other three other items that they ask us to mention, uh, advocate uh, with them for some signalization of um, of an intersection, talking about standards that are used for affordability, and working with the Hidden Valley uh, neighborhood, and we're certainly happy to do those. Uh, the issue that's a problem for us would be doing single family homes here. I think that would be a problem for any development team. And this is one of those areas, I think with our new zoning coming in, we're going to see infill of attached housing product. Um, so uh, that said, happy to have follow-up conversations with you all. Again, we expect to be before the Hidden Valley neighborhood at their meeting on the 7th to talk through this. I don't know that we'll come to a kumbaya, uh, but certainly three of the items that they gave us, I think we can certainly engage on, and hopefully we can have conversations with them about, about this duplex housing um, product, because I think that's going to be allowed one way or the other in June, and there may be some benefits of getting a conditional plan here where they get some commitments from a developer Developer and that it's not left to chance what is developed under on this site under an N1B. Happy to take questions. Thank you. Um, Marjorie Parker and Charlene Henderson, uh, you have 10 minutes to split between um, both of you. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. I am Margie Parker, president of Hidden Valley Community Association. I'm here to vote against the rezoning of 2293, the gondola. The gondola property is right off of Yuma, which is one of the main streets in Hidden Valley that runs from Cinderella across Hidden Valley Road. What we want there is two-story townhomes that are detached, not attached. We want uh, these townhomes that may be able to be sold later uh, and not rent it. Uh, also, also, we are concerned about there not being a stoplight at Cinderella Road and Sugar Creek Road, and so we've asked the developer to advocate for us to get a light there, and there's only one way out of Gondola. Gondola is, is sort of an undeveloped street that's off of Yuma, and it only has uh, about two houses up in there. Uh, we would like to see less rentals in Hidden Valley and increased home ownership. We would like for you to consider uh, when you're negotiating with the developers, affordable housing that match the Hidden Valley area median income, which is a $30,000 less than the city, than the Greater Charlotte. Like uh, Attorney Brown said, we met with Attorney Brown of for C ZCMB1 via Zoom, and they have. He just said that he'll be able to come to our meeting on the first Tuesday of the month. We want to work amicably with the developers who choose to build in and around Hidden Valley, and we want to work with our district representative, Dante Anderson. I thank you so much for your time. Next. Good evening. <clears throat> so some of you probably know who I am. Uh, my name is Charlene Henderson, and I am a resident of Hidden Valley Community. I also serve on Hidden Valley Community Association. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is a letter of compassion and empathy and a letter of need. Because I look at your expressions, and I look at your demeanors, and I look at how some of you have come into the room and have came back. I mean, have kind of like not come back. So I really want you to take these things in consideration and take us very seriously. We love our communities and we want to make sure that we get what we need in our communities, more resources. As we think about 2040, it's important to keep all of these things in mind. We need the Charlotte 2040 where communities are able to leverage their collective voice to make sure that demands on land uses and decisions are for us and are to be made. As many of you have seen, there, are, there have been um, a, re a flux, excuse me, a recent influx of economic development deals in and around the Hidden Valley areas. 
How do we envision our communities retaining their voices with conditional rezoning is replaced by, by more right development under the UDO? This means that those with more resources and funding will be flooding into our areas and further increasing the cost of living by demanding more high price housing while public schools will feel further, will feel further and further strained by the increase of student population. These economic development deals are appearing out of thin air. They're affecting the quality of life for our residents who live in these areas. Less tax revenue means less money, well-paved roads, fully funded schools, effective and efficient transit, and less interventions in the housing market to ensure quality and affordable housing. Charlotte Future will be captured by corporations and developers and politicians that aid in them that if we are not included in the process. We support measures that protect our membership in our communities and when zoning that allows for diverse types of housing on single, single family lots that retain community character and rich history. Please consider making sure that our representative represents our community and our voices. I just wanted to make sure I read this because, again, a lot of you know me and I'm an advocate for those who are marginalized and unprotected. We need our representative to step up and represent for us. We put in information, we've sent emails and gave numerous occasions for you guys to really come out and see what is going on in our communities and be an advocate and champion with us. Please hear our voices and know that we are in need of good representation and we don't want to have big developers and corporate um, entities come into our communities and just not look at what we need. We don't need the big stuff. We need to be just left alone and we also need to make sure that the resources that we have, that you have, we get. We want to make sure that our other sides of the community understand that we have to work together. Let's reach across the table and see how we can come to a common denominator. And I hope to hear from you guys soon. Um, Dante, we've reached out to you and I wanna make sure that you, you kinda come back to us and, and, and let us know that you're, you're rocking with us, okay? Yes, ma'am? All right, thank you for your time and happy birthday, nice. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, thank you. Ms. Jo uh, Ms. Johnson. Oh, okay, thank Well, if you wanna. Ms. Anderson. Yeah, I'll defer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms., uh, Ms. Henderson and uh, Ms. Parker for sharing your perspective. Um, I have received information. Oh, I'm sorry, hold on, I apologize. Okay. Mr. Brown, you get two minutes oh, to rebut. Oh, um, and, and maybe some of this will go to that. Uh, you know, I appreciate the feedback from the neighborhood. And this is a challenge. Um, I don't envy being in your seat sometimes. Um, and so we, we will have continue to have a conversation with the neighborhood as well as the district rep and others. Again, uh, and here ZCM owns the property. Um, so we, we have an option now under the conditional zoning you know, to work together and to some, obtain some conditions. This is not a giant development where there's 300 units and, and it's a $500,000 contribution you know, is the answer. But I think there can be a back and forth. I think a number of the uh, requests we got are reasonable. Um, and so the question is, does, does this move forward in a conditional environment where the neighborhood gets some insurances? Uh, and if not, that's okay. But I think there would be a buy right development here too, where then the community would have less input. So happy to interact with everyone. Thank you. Ms. Anderson. Thank you. Um, I w I've started by saying thank you, Ms. Parker and Mrs. Um, Henderson for your comments and your insight. Um, I can assure you and Colin, Mr. Brown can attest to this. We meet on a regular case, uh, cadence and we have spoken about this particular uh, petition numerous times. So I'm glad that um, Mr. Brown is going to the neighborhood community uh, at meeting to understand the additional ask from the community. This is actually a, a great opportunity um, based on what you've just heard earlier for the community to work collaboratively with the developer to ensure that some of the community needs are met in addition to what's already been laid out in your response to the petition. So I will continue to advocate for you and, and knock on doors and have conversations in spaces that um, you guys might not have insight to, but I, I'm working very hard to make sure that we get the best outcome 
for a historic, historic neighborhood of Hidden Valley. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I just had a couple questions. Thank you, Ms. Parker and Ms. Henderson for coming out and advocating. I had, a, I, I had a question, something you said, if you can come back to the microphone. You can come to, down to Ms. Henderson. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So you, one of you ladies stated that you would like to see detached townhomes? Yes, detached townhomes as opposed to attached townhomes. And I feel that if, it, if they're detached, it may not even need to be rezoned. Okay. That was the reason I was opposing the rezoning. It, I, I've, uh, my understanding, Attorney Brown, there are, what, 14 detached townhomes that you want to, or attached townhomes? Duplexes. Duplexes, okay. And we were uh, talking with the board. Uh, we would like to see detached townhomes. It may not be as many, but we feel that as far as one day if they're re if they're uh, if they are sold, okay. it would be maybe a easier sale than the atta attached mm -hmm. or the duplexes. I understand. And it's a, it's we're not talking about a lot of homes, so you know, detached or or attached. But we just mm -hmm. feel for the area and for the character of the area, because we have try um, we have split levels, mm -hmm. so we have two story split levels already, so we're thinking that if we get detached townhomes, it would really be an asset to that little short street that's undeveloped. So would that be like single single family homes? Is that what you're? Single family, two story. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, another developer proposed 20 of those for Wellingford. We agreed, we worked with him and he agreed that he would do the two-story townhomes, as opposed to he was wanting to do the four stories. And so we said, you know, the uh, two-story detach. We're thinking about the selling value, of, um, value that would come from that and also the character of the neighborhood. Okay. And this is actually, in the in the interior of the neighborhood, right? This is, this is right off of Yuma Street. Yuma is one of Hidden Valley's uh, streets that cover that is covered under our restricted deeds. Okay. This street gondola comes right on to Yuma. You can only get out of gondola property uh, at Yuma. Are there any other multifamily in that? It's yeah, there there is multifamily on Cinderella, okay. which is closer to Sugar Creek, a four lane highway where you can build the apartments. So there are apartments on Cinderella. But I mean, off off Yuma, in the, this, no. This is like in the. This is like in the Hidden Valley. Yeah. Yes, the other homes that uh, the Mayfield project was trying to build. Right, I remember. The uh, they. The, the profit, the residents, you know, went to court on that and they were, they won that they could not build those eight, 188 units inside of Hidden Valley oh. because of the restricted deeds. I, re I remember that. I came to those meetings. So. Yes. I know you remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much. But um, that's what we were thinking because we're thinking about you know, we're, right now a lot of rentals are in Hidden Valley, and we want we want to get champion, champion for our home ownership right. as well. So I do have I do have a, a quick comment. My my comment is, it's a, a short. Let me ask. I'm sorry because we have to follow the rules. Okay. Is there uh, was 
can you explain your comment or anything else you want to add, <laughs> Ms. Henderson? <laughs> May I add that the, the road or the street is very short. And if you are a developer, and I've looked at the petitions throughout this whole, majority of this whole night, we have repeated names of developers and corporations that seem as though they're just buying and buying and buying and not considering and considering and considering. My goal is please consider that this is a historic community right. that want to be preserved okay, okay. historically. So to something Char else. Charlene, I have to apologize. Um, if you study uh, real estate or planning, this is gentrification, just 101. And I apologize, you know, um, oh this is, you, Hidden Valley was the reason that I opposed the 2040 plan. Thank you. It was foreseeable. So it's up to council when I when we will redistrict, redistricted, <laughs> and I um, Hidden Valley was removed from District Four. I told you I would support you. You have a District One representative, and there are four at large re representatives. So um, it's you know um, you know we've lost our historically black neighborhoods in this city, and I'm not you know I'm not even from Charlotte, right? But I've been here long enough, and I've Heard, I've heard Charlene talk about it, but it doesn't matter. There's gentrification and displacement all throughout the country. And we see this happening. Hidden Valley has beautiful, large lots, you know? And this was so foreseeable. So I, 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 I apologize. Um, yeah, yeah, there's neighborhoods like Wesley Heights, other neighborhoods throughout the city. So, you know, it's up to council. Um, to 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 make the decision, but yeah, I, I it's it's really sad to 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 see the duplexes and um, right in the interior Absolutely. of the neighborhood, which is what those opposed to the 2040 plan were so concerned about. So um, I hear you, and you're not wrong, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so we just want you to do your job. I'm listening. Thank you. <laughs> do your job. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Ms. Ashmira. Thank you. Um, Ms. Henderson and Ms. Parker, thank you so much for your continued advocacy for, for the historic neighborhood and the community. Uh, I enjoyed reading about the history of Hidden Valley in the newspaper recently and how Mr. Harvey Gant had started. Um, actually establishing and starting a new family there in Hidden Valley, and how it created an affordable uh, op affordable housing opportunity for many, many African Americans, um, and how gentrification has affected many families who live there. So I really learned a lot from that article that was recently in the Charlotte Observer. Um, and. I understand, especially considering how Hidden Valley is uh, rapidly being gentrified, the importance of affordable housing. And I wonder if any of this development, I know Mr. Brown talked about how residents would be able to afford to live here. Are we looking at any House Charlotte program or any affordable housing, or is this all uh, just uh, market rate housing? Because I wasn't sure when you said about affordable or people would be able to afford, are you looking at affordable housing? The goal now is the most attainable market rate housing that can be developed. I'm not saying anything's off the table. You know, so we're happy to have conversations with the neighborhood. Um, to make it more, it would be virtually impossible to make it more affordable and have less density. So that would be the conversation we would have to have. Okay, so I just want to make sure uh, I'm, <laughs> Ms. Higler Gray, I'm looking at you. I'm asking if there is a volunteer commit volunteer commitment to any affordable housing by the petitioner. But from what I hear, that's not at this point. Not not currently, but that is certainly something we're open to discussing with change. the neighborhood. Yes. Yeah, uh, and I know that you are going to meet with neighbors, uh, and I would like to hear from the neighbors about. Uh, looking at House Charlotte program, which really provides home ownership opportunities, and also we have other affordable housing uh, incentives for uh, developers. 
So I'd be interested in hearing your feedback on that. And there was one infrastructure improvement request that you had made, Ms. Parker. Um, Mr. Brown, if you could comment on that infrastructure improvement request that was made by uh, Ms. Parker. Sure, I and think if that, that could be addressed. I think the question, and a couple of things, like gondola, is, as Ms. Parker mentioned, is, is really unimproved. There's the possibility that gondola could be extended out to Sugar Creek and create another access point to the neighborhood. I think the, uh, the point in the letter that was asked is that if we could support the request for a traffic signal yes. at Cinderella and Sugar, Sugar Creek. Yes. Currently, <clears throat> currently, we have only Hidden Valley Road with the traffic light. And so Cinderella and Sugar Creek is very dangerous. People are trying to make a left to go toward not trying. So we definitely need a, a traffic light there. And the traffic now is coming to Hidden Valley Road, and it's... it's uh, it's lined up at Hidden Valley Road. Okay, thank. You. So, is that, Mr. Brown? That that would be part of your discussion. Is that what I hear? We're cer certainly ha happy to have all these discussions. I mean, the track of the matter is, and we'll be honest with the neighborhood too, is that on on June one, this will be developable kind of by right as towns. And, and that's a frank conversation we'll have. There may be some upside to this. And if there's a way that we can get them on board we'll, and it worked feasibly, we'll have that conversation. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, Ms. Anderson said that she has been working with you and she has been having this conversation. So I look forward to continuing to work with Ms. Anderson to address some of the concerns that's been raised by our residents. And I appreciate the work that's been done so far and uh, I know Ms. Anderson has been keeping us posted on uh, developments in District 1, so I look forward to working with her on that. Thank you. Ms. Watlington. Oh, I don't have a comment. Mr. Bacari. Thank you. You guys can all take your seats now. Uh, one, may I say one thing, please, or is that off the table? Uh, you have to be asked a question. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Are you done? Oh. What? No, I'm waiting. Until they're they clear the podium so I can have my comments. Thank you. No, I don't have any need for questions. Thank you. Um, He's not the last person. It, there, Sorry, there'll be I'm more, sorry. there'll be more opportunity. Yeah, I'm go ahead. So uh, a couple important points that need to be brought up right now. One, uh, it was said that they see all the same names for these deals. Uh, I think those of us who are here every month and understand um, there were probably almost all unique companies and developers per each one of the cases we had, they hire legal representation and you see the legal representation. So it's not the same developers and people that are doing this every time. It's the, develop, the developers' lawyers that they hire to help navigate the process. I think that's very important. I think the other important part as we talk about who's doing their jobs properly in this city is it's a lot of the private sector companies out there and developers that are coming in that are investing in the infrastructure and doing our job for us. We're not actually doing a deep transformational investment in infrastructure like we should be doing. So I think that's an important note for us to make as well. And then you mentioned the word 2040 comp plan several times and you kind of championed it. Yeah, I just want everyone to be aware the things that were espoused were the exact opposite of what was put in there and a reason why a number of us actually opposed it. So if you're coming and looking for single family housing to be preserved, the, the 2040 comp plan and the UDO does the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. By right, you will not be able to see, touch or negotiate with that. It makes it more dense by nature. If you are looking to have more opportunities uh, to deal make community benefits, that goes away. The whole point of the, of the 2040 comp plan, the UDO, is as Mr. Winston says many times, and rightly so, I, I will say, is to get from a deal-making city to a policy city. And a policy city does more things by right, and we have less discussions around the dais like this. Of which, so j just be sure as you're understanding and, and saying it's the, tw it's the 2040 vision in the comp plan, it does all the exact opposite things that you just said there. And I think the final point to make sure you're aware of is um, 
this is not something that, that they're really going out on a huge limb to say, we want to do this over and above what we should be doing. In fact, you heard they're going to be able to do things like this by right in the coming, uh, in, in the coming months. So I think this is an important moment to realize you can have a transaction like you're doing right now and you can get concessions and you can get things for the community. Uh, but if you need things like affordable housing, that is going to require more density, the, the very thing that you said you're not interested in. So I, I think everyone needs to walk away from here eyes wide open that if you want infrastructure investments, now's the time to negotiate in good faith with them. If you want more affordable housing in your backyard, they're going to have to increase the number of units to make that work and feasible. There, there's, there's, it is literally a binary option. So I hope everyone walks away with a better understanding of how this all works. Ms. Ms. Mayfield first. Thank you, Mayor Potem, because I would love for the district rep to be able to close it out. I have a question for staff. It was mentioned the D restrictions that are in the area. Help me understand if we know that this street is a local road, how, if any, what, if any, impact would be covering this particular project considering there are deep restrictions in the area? And maybe Mr. Brown might be able to answer this as well, whichever one of you or both can answer it. I think it is true that there are deed restrictions in the Hidden Valley neighborhood. Um, the attorneys that have done the transactional work for the ownership team do not believe that they apply to this parcel. Mm -hmm. This is on the edge of Hidden Valley, so not, not in the Hidden Valley proper that was developed with those deed restrictions. Okay. That's, that was my main question. Right. Understanding you. that. Before we go to Ms. Anderson. Mm -hmm. Can I? No, ma'am. Um, before well, we all have to get um, one time first, I'm going to I'm going to speak real quick. Um, you know, I wanted to speak to something Miss Henderson said. She referenced a bunch of different kind of parties um, um, that serve interests, and I, I would encourage the community um, to recognize when politicians are being politicians and are telling you the things that you may want to hear things that they that uh, may be convenient um, but things that are not necessarily true um, this council convened a housing and job summit last week to look at the data what is the condition on the ground what is the reality of what we can expect we will show that while uh, the population growth in Charlotte is slowing it is steadily increasing um, we were also told through the data, um, as Ms. Mayfield mentioned in a previous um, um, petition, um, that um, we want to keep people that are here in centered right now. Data showed that if not one person moved here um, for the foreseeable future, this population in Charlotte would continue to grow just as births outpace deaths. The data also showed that there is a severe imbalance of the supply of housing uh, at, at all points in time, um, particular median housing, right? The median level of house to, 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 to afford the, the median level of, of, of home to purchase, uh, you have to make something like, a family has to make about $160,000, something ridiculous to afford uh, uh, 10 per the, the 10th percentile of that, of that medium price, you would have to earn about 80%. Um, it shows, the numbers show that 80% um, of, 80, excuse me, $80,000. Numbers show that 80% of people can't afford to own a median of a home. 50% can't afford that, um, uh, that 10th percentile house. Now, what it is also is, has, has showed is that this community, like many other communities around the country, has not built enough housing. It's just that we don't have the supply of housing that is uh, necessary to fill the demand. The current level and, and the pace we're on, we're not gonna meet the future level. So building more housing is not 
in, in Hidden Valley is not what gentrification looks like. Continuing to limit the ability to build more homes in areas like Hidden Valley are what gentrification looks like. It's going to continue to make it much more unaffordable for working people, uh, 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 not even of the lowest level of, of the income scale. We're not talking, you know, uh, zero to 30. You know, we're, we're talking folks at uh, the, the median, the median, um, the median 100% of AMI for a family of four in Charlotte right now is $94,000. It means you can't, you can't purchase a median level home in places like Hidden Valley right now. And if we continue to restrict the building of housing, any, any, it's just going to continue to rise. I'll give you an anecdote. <clears throat> you know, um, I, my mother just moved down here from New York uh, because my 87 year old grandmother is no longer mobile, right? In, in the same sense, they had to, um, we had to, uh, she can't live alone in New York, New York City anymore. First place we went to look was Hidden Valley to try to buy a home. The amount of 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 um, capital investment that would have been needed to even start to make some of the homes livable for people in that condition it was untenable. It was untenable, not because we didn't want to, but because the, the real costs are, are what they are right now. And when we look at populations like folks in Hidden Valley or folks that we want to age in place in places like this, worst things that we can do is limit the types of, of, of home ownership, rental, all types of housing. Now that might be difficult to, to kind of reckon with as honestly as Mr. Bakari um, uh, 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 said, uh, but the idea that um, limiting housing is going to somehow stabilize the condition of people who are housing in stable, whether it's on an acute level in particular neighborhoods or on the at large perspective in our entire community is, is, is just leading our folks astray. Again, and I, I, I just have to say that we this again this 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 council literally uh, almost fought to convene that housing and job summit last week that told us this, and we're either whether or not we become a deal making city again, or we go forward with being a plan um, planned city, a plan oriented city. We're going to have to reckon with, or we're going to deal with the facts on the ground despite how difficult and, and, and um, um, how, you know, how they might make us wrestle with some of our values and some of our conceptions, or are we gonna deal with facts and are we gonna be truthful about the situation and, and, and figure out better path forward? So I don't have a question, but I, I just had to um, make that comment. Um, Ms. Anderson, I recognize you. I know Ms. Johnson wanted to talk again. I don't know if you want to close us out, but I, can, I will recognize you. I'll allow Ms. Johnson to go first and I can close Thank it you. out. Thank Ms. you, Councilmember Anderson. I was just gonna say, and I hope you all know about the, the pilot in Hidden Valley to, to help residents stay in place. Good, okay, because those are the kind of tools that we have to offer the, the residents. Um, you know I've always been truthful with you. Thank you. So um, I, I think that this is an opportunity for the city, uh, for policy makers to create tools. It's not that they don't want their neighborhood improved. It's the impact that it has on taxes for the existing residents that they're no, when they're no longer able to afford to, to keep up with the improvement. Everyone, they want their, their property value to increase, but we have to be intentional about uh, th this, this neighborhood and, and assisting with the residents. I fought for that pilot, for that staying in place, for Hidden Valley to be a part of it. So we want to be very, very focused on that and continue to work with the residents. It's going to, it's going to change. So, um, you know, unless there, you know, even if there were six votes to deny this one, you know, the, the buy right that 
in, in June. So uh, continue to work. Let's, let's be intentional about the tools in helping the current residents. That's the gentrification when folks are displaced because they cannot keep up with uh, the, the, the cost of, of housing. You know, you, you know now that there are houses for over $300,000 in oh. Hidden Valley, yeah, that are selling. I remember when the first one sold. So that's all, and I would just also encourage you to send that video of the history of Hidden Valley to all of the council members because that's what's important to them, the pride and the history. And uh, Council Member Mitchell, if you saw him laugh and he was saying how beautiful the young ladies used to be in Hidden Valley and went back in the day and still are. <laughs> so that's all. Thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Make sure nope, to nope. Hey. you can't ask. Uh, you can submit. You can submit the question to the clerk. I'm sorry, be but be submitted. sure to send that that video to all of us. Ms. Thank you, Miss Anderson. Yep. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I did want to ask Miss Parker if she can come back to the podium very quickly. But what I want to say is that I appreciate the time and the input tonight on the discussion around an incredibly important neighborhood in the Charlotte community, the historic Hidden Valley. Um, as we've as we've heard, we have lots of great information from the Housing and Jobs Summit last week that we didn't have before um, in a packaged way that we can look at um, the directionality of our city. And conversely, we want to do everything we can to help protect the charm and the history of Hidden Valley. So as new housing stock will come on board, we have to collaborate and work with developers if they're in the right to build to make sure that we are, they're building uh, new housing stock that fits with the history and the intentionality of the neighborhood. So I think you have, uh, Ms. Parker, an opportunity to do that now um, with the developer. Colin has been very open in the conversations that I've had as he's represented the developer to ensure that the community's voice is being heard and that you have a seat at the table in anything as it relates to development that would occur within Hidden Valley on a go-forward basis. This, this is a unique opportunity before the UDO takes, comes into place this summer. So we want to maximize and, op and optimize that. Um, for Hidden Valley, and of course, I'm going to partner with you any way, you. shape, or form that I can to do so. So um, that's really important as well. Miss um, Miss Johnson talked about the pilot of staying in place. We also know that there's been some public-private partnerships within the community of Hidden Valley to help upkeep uh, existing housing stock for other families that are staying in place. We were all a part of, you were a part of that, I was a part of that last year. And there's plans for even more this year. So I feel like the future of Hidden Valley is very bright um, from a home ownership perspective. So I did, Ms. Parker, just wanted to make sure that you had your perspective shared because I believe you wanted to make another comment so the entire council can hear your perspective. Okay. Uh, the one thing that I wanted to say, we have, we've had some phenomenal meetings last year, and we've had um, uh, the city is has purchased some homes out in Hidden Valley and rented and uh, sold them, and also we have met with the stand in place. The one thing with the stand in place, if I, I'm afraid that those folks like myself gonna fall between the cracks. Mm -hmm. The people who don't meet, who are over the income level uh, by fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 as opposed to what the city's threshold for being able to get the help from the city for fixing your property to stay in place. Yes. And so uh, somehow I'll find a way to try to Right, or, or you and I can talk about that some more, Dante. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a real, real issue because we have a lot of uh, retired teachers. I retired from the city. So we have people that's over that income level. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they're going to get left behind because they're going to need those major repairs on their home and not have anybody to help them. Yep. And, and you're right that the population base of Hidden Valley might feel it more based on where they, they are as it relates to retirement. 
that's a real issue that we have across the entire city. Yeah. There's this great area that a lot of residents fall in the gap of because they're just either just above or just yes, below. They're right. They're, and we've ha we've had discussions around that before, and that's a real challenge. And we're that's to that's one of the biggest things that concern me because we have. 1,400, 1,500, the statistics say, I say we have a lot more seniors, but that's something that I want you to call me anytime like Renee did and let's talk about Absolutely. some things like that. But we will meet with uh, first Tuesday, 630, we will meet with Attorney Brown and we've had conversation already, so you are welcome to come if you can. So, thank you very thank much. You. Thank close. you, Mayor Pro Second. Again, this motion has been made properly second. Um, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, close public. What we can, raise your hand. Any opposed? That's unanimous to move on. We move on to rezoning petition 2022-103 by Dominion Realty Partners, LLC, located on approximately 10.18 acres, uh, located on the north side of, um, of excuse me of Perimeter Point Parkway and on the southwest side of Rebecca Avenue, west of West Highvola Road and south of West Boulevard in Council District 3, Miss Watlington's District. The current zoning is I1CD General Industrial Conditional and R2022 MF Multifamily Residential. The proposed zoning is UR2CD Urban Residential Conditional. Uh, staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation, the environment, and site and building design. I was just handed a piece of paper uh, from the uh, clerk. Um, uh, there is uh, speakers here against this uh, petition. So after Mr. Petten's um, presentation, um, uh, Mr. McVeigh, you will have uh, 10 minutes. Thank you, 2022 103. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, let me get back to my slides on this one. Where are we? Well, I'll just go from here. 10 acres. Uh, it's off of Perimeter Point Drive at the end of Glen Lake Drive and Rebecca Ave. Uh, the site is currently zoned. Uh, a mix of uh, I-1 conditional, excuse me, and R-22MF. And the proposed zoning is for UR-2 conditional. Adopted place type is campus and neighborhood one. And the proposal is to request up to 270 multifamily residential dwellings, provide workforce housing program to reserve 6% of the units for a minimum of 15 years, which would maintain monthly rents for households earning 80% or less of the area median income. Building heights limited to 65 feet provides a class C 25 foot buffer, including a row uh, of plantings, including eight foot Burford Hollies planted to 12 or 15 foot on center when adjacent to existing single family dwellings along Rebecca Avenue. Does provide a class C buffer along the rear property boundary where you see some vacant uh, land on the backside where that green line is. Uh, <clears throat> installs an eight foot planting strip and eight foot sidewalk along internal public streets along the site's Perimeter Point Parkway. Additionally, we commit to extending Perimeter Point Parkway sidewalk beyond the site's frontage out to Tyvola Road. Also improves uh, the site's frontage of Rebecca Avenue to a local residential medium street with an eight-foot planting strip and eight-foot sidewalk. Uh, pledges that buildings will front a minimum of 60% of the total street frontage of Perimeter Point, as well as the new internal public street, uh, residential ground floor units uh, on Perimeter Point Parkway and the new internal street will be raised 12 to 24 inches, and then an 8,000 square foot minimum of open space uh, to include things like walking paths, landscaping, seating areas would be provided. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation, environment, and site and building design, inconsistent with the 2040 policy map for campus and that neighborhood one place type. Uh, multifamily housing would provide some housing options in close proximity to this adjacent office park and nearby hospital, uh, and it does provide some buffering uh, adjacent to the uh, excuse me adjacent to the single family dwellings along Rebecca Avenue. Uh, and we will turn it over to the petitioner and the community for their presentations and take any questions following that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Good, good evening, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council, members of the zoning committee. Keith McVeigh with Moore Van Allen assisting Dominion Realty Partners LLC with this request. Uh, with me tonight representing uh, Dominion Realty Partners is Wade Woodworth. He's available to answer questions. Uh, we will work, continue to work with Dave and his staff 
uh, to resolve the remaining outstanding issues prior to the Zoning Committee meeting. We want to thank him for his support up to this date. As Dave mentioned, uh, just over 10 acres located just south of West Boulevard and, and east of Billy Graham on Perimeter Point Parkway, zoned a combination of industrial and multifamily, requested zoning UR2CD to allow a new multifamily residential community. Uh, as Dave mentioned, this is an area where there is a large concentration of employment uses. Uh, the site is actually in part of the Lake Point Corporate Center. Is, is, is where the site is located, the I-1CD zone for a future office building, the portion of the site zoned I-1. As Dave mentioned, we are working or have committed to extend sidewalk perimeter, along Perimeter Point Parkway to provide the residents of the community access to West Tavola Road and uh, the uses and, and other activities along that area. There is bus service that serves the VA hospital that's also located to our south. Uh, there was a rezoning last uh, year ago, very similar, right behind the VA hospital here at UR2CD. Uh, Dominion Really Partners was actually part of the petitioner on that as well. And that was a request that added more housing to this changing area of the city, which is going from a single use uh, type of corporate park, mainly office uses. The old Coliseum used to be out here, that's now being developed with City Park. So adding residential to support that growing those existing employment uses to, and also to support the, the growing uh, residential uses on West Boulevard. We have been working with the West Boulevard Neighborhood Coalition on this petition similarly to how we did on the prior petition and they are in support of the request. We are inconsistent with the campus place type recommendation. I think that recommendation looks mainly at the existing zoning and the uses that are there now more than looking at the transition that is starting to occur where other uses are now coming in to support the, resi the existing employment uses, both retail and residential. This is on the residential side. Uh, like I mentioned, City Park has already added retail uses on West Tyvola. This strengthens the marketplace, hopefully will strengthen the marketplace for additional retail uses. As Dave mentioned, we meet a number of the goals of the 2040 plan. Uh, including one of the goals of adding uses to single-use corporate center park or corporate facilities like this. This is a zoomed out shot of the area. The site is here. Uh, City Park, which was the old Coliseum, Charlotte Coliseum location, which is now being developed, developed with a residential mixed-use community. Renaissance Park and, and, and then the tennis facility just also there. Uh, we have, will have future access to Urban Creek Greenway. And then, as I mentioned, the, the also believe this residential will support the growth along west, the West Boulevard corridor. Site planned, as Dave mentioned, requests up to 270 residential units. This is a rendered site plan so you can get a better idea of the look or the uh, arrangement of buildings and parking. We do have a new public street for additional connectivity that will extend to the parcels to our north and f eventually extend and provide connectivity to West Boulevard from this site. Uh, based on the subdivision regulations, we do have frontage on Rebecca, so we are providing access to Rebecca and improving Rebecca. There is a small portion of the property here on Rebecca that is being set aside between existing single family homes. It's just open space tree save. And as Dave mentioned, we've created a 25 foot buffer and then supplemented that with additional planning Burford Hollies to create a, a good transition buffer between the proposed development and the existing homes. As Dave mentioned, we have made a commitment to 6% of the units being workforce housing at 80% of AMI for a minimum of 15 years. And we are partnering with the West Boulevard Neighborhood Coalition uh, and they are in support of the petition. We're happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, Amanda Grant, uh, you have 10 minutes. So, um, I hadn't planned on speaking, was just showing up to see what this was all about. Um, my family has lived on Rebecca Avenue for 40 plus years, and it's a, it was a gravel street at one point. Um, it's been paved, and um, we've, we've had a lot of development, and I think a lot of the city council members have 
mentioned just the growth and infrastructure needed. Um, part of that is there's been zoning um, all around this area. Um, across the street on the other side of Rebecca is 115, I think, townhomes being put, put in right now across from my mother's uh, residence. Um, that's, you know, it's a very small, like barely two cars fit down it at once. We have a lot of street people park on the street and if two cars are parked at houses opposite sides, you can't get a third car in between them. Um, on top of that, the VA hospital and the business park that has been developed um, has created an increase in traffic um, exponentially. It is dangerous at five o'clock, six o'clock, trying to make a left or right hand turn really out of Rebecca or Ellen um, onto West Tyvola um, because there, it's just a stop sign. Um, and it's, so the infrastructure really just needs to be in place to handle the number of people that would be there. That's, uh, he said 270. 115 across the street. I mean, I just don't know that there's going to be enough room for everybody. Um, the little open access greenway that they put up on the screen is actually smack dab next to my mom's house, the place where I grew up. That place used to be a farm. <laughs> I can remember playing in those, that forest. Um, so, um, we're not necessarily opposed to the entire development. Access to Rebecca is probably what we're most opposed to, or at least me and my mom and probably the other residents on the street that we've spoken to. Um, but that access to Rebecca is, it's a dead end street. And we've had people, you know, throughout the years come down there and even though it says dead end at the very top of the street, we have ton there's tons of people that just come down and turn around in my mom's driveway, which is not a big problem, but if there's more access at the end of the street, there's just gonna be more and more cars. And so I just don't know that, you know, the infrastructure is in place for all of the units, not just theirs, but the 115 that are already approved and being built momentarily. I mean, as we speak, they're being put in there. There's little kids that live on the street, um, you know, triplets and, you know, very young kids that, you know, walk up and down the street. But, you know, if there's all these cars and it's, like I said, there's, it's not even, a, you know, two lanes. It's, there's not even a median line in the street on Rebecca. And the same thing for Ellen and New Pinola. Those streets, you know, are very rural. I mean, that's what I, that's how it is. So, um, I think that's all I really have. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. McVeigh, you have two minutes to, for a rebuttal. Uh, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, we'll be happy to meet with Ms. Grant and see if we can address some of her concerns. We weren't aware, aware of those concerns until tonight. I, I would point out that the main access point to this community is really the extension of Glen Lake Drive and Perimeter Point Parkway. Both these connections provide direct connection back to West Tybola at signalized intersections. Uh, part of the improvement that was done when this was rezoned for a corporate business park uh, West Tybola Road was ex widened and extended and signalized intersections were put in place. Uh, we are aware that the, under the R current R22MF zoning, there is a townhome community under development on the opposite side of Rebecca from uh, this development. They will be in making improvements to Rebecca as well. We are making improvements to Rebecca, which will include widening and adding sidewalk, curb and gutter. We actually, this portion of Rebecca that's on this, our site, is actually not is a paper street and will we actually be extending a new a new street to public street standards uh, and again we would not foresee most of our residents using Rebecca we would see them using the other roads to the south which really provide better access to West Tyvola can't guarantee there won't be any folks using Rebecca that's part of the connectivity policy and at some point in time as this property redevelops as well 
uh, we would ex anticipate that the city is going to ask that Rebecca be continued and potentially provide connectivity to West Boulevard. The townhome development does also have access to other streets further to the east, uh, and we we're happy to share those plans with Ms. Grant. Uh, no, sorry, Ms. Yeah, Ms. Grant, and and see if we can address our other concerns. We we did we were intentional about this area here by not putting proposing any development or activity area at all, but leaving that as just a open space green green area that would be just tree save and a, an open space for the folks on on in the community as well as the folks on Rebecca. Thank Happy you to. very much. Yes, sir. Um, are any questions or comments from council? Close. Second. Second. Motion to um, close the public hearing. It's been made and properly second. Any discussion on that motion? Hearing none. All in favor of the close public hearing, please raise your hand. Uh, are there any opposed? Any none. We will move on to item number 37. Thank you very much. Um, agenda item number 36, rezoning petition 2022-075 by Morteb LLC for approximately 20.96 acres located on the north and south side of East Westinghouse Boulevard, west of South Boulevard in Council District 3, Miss Watlington's district. The current zoning is I-1 light industrial and I-2 general industrial. Um, um, the proposed zoning um, is TODNC, Transit Oriented Development Neighborhood Center, um, and TODCC, uh, TODCC, yes, Transit Oriented Development Community Center. Um, staff does not recommend approval of this petition um, and therefore um, the petitioner will have 10 minutes after uh, Mr. Petten's uh, presentation. All right, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. 2022-075, uh, 15 and three quarter acres off East Westinghouse, Crafters Lane, uh, just to the yeah. west of Crump Road uh, and South Boulevard. It is currently zoned I-1 conditional and I-1 as well as I-2 general industrial, so uh, all industrial zoning types uh, along these properties. Proposed zoning is for both TODCC and TODNC. Uh, those transitions are based on where those properties that are involved in the rezoning are located in proximity to uh, existing uh, station areas. So the NC would be within a mile, CC, I think, uh, would be within that half mile corridor. Uh, policy map calls for manufacturing logistics place type. You can see the majority of the place type around this area is that manufacturing logistics. We do have some activity center where we had existing TOD zoning that was brought in through the alignment uh, back several years ago. Uh, as mentioned, staff does not recommend approval of the petition. It's inconsistent with the policy map recommendation for manufacturing logistics place type. Uh, and while there's some TOD in the general area, uh, staff wasn't comfortable moving this one forward from mainly just a policy perspective. Uh, you know, we certainly understand that TOD is uh, in close proximity adjacent to the site and we do have some station areas. Uh, we were a little policy stretched on coming up with uh, some of those uh, points that I'm sure Ms. Grant will be able to articulate with you why they think this is a, a good uh, location for TOD. Uh, again, our concern is mainly when we don't have policy consistency, one of the next things we look at is context and existing and ongoing development of the area. Haven't quite seen the transition that we've seen in other places on South Boulevard or even on some of the later petitions we have this evening along the North Tryon corridor to start to make that transition, at least from staff's perspective, but certainly understand that market forces may be driving that a little bit uh, further down. So uh, with that, we'll turn it over to the petitioner and we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have following their presentation. Thank you. Grant. Good evening again, Bridget Grant, land use consultant with Moore and Van Allen. Pleased to be here tonight representing Jason Tebbin and Nathan Morrison on this rezoning. I promise I won't use the full 10 minutes. It's been a long night already. Um, as Dave mentioned, the site, it's actually currently 21 acres. We are removing a portion of the site that's south of Westinghouse and limiting the site to just what's north of Westinghouse. So as Dave mentioned, the site's located west of South Boulevard. The area in green that's fronting South Boulevard and Crump were rezoned by the city in 2019 to TODCC. The interesting thing here is if you see the area outlined in white, the same person, the petitioner, owns the area outlined at white in white and thus is seeking to rezone all of their property to a consistent zoning designation. The site is slightly more than a quarter of a mile from Sharon Road West. Dave mentioned the proximity to two different station areas. It's dead center in the middle. The distance measurement has been used as a rationale to support other TOD zonings historically, probably for the 
past few years. Um, the frontage of this petitioner's site is within the half mile walk distance established by the city. So you can see where the site is in relation to the two station areas, so the top and bottom. The green area is already zoned TODCC. And we're seeking alignment of the back portion of the petitioner's site to TODNC and TODCC. As Dave mentioned, we do have a rationale that we believe you can support to justify rezoning. It is consistent with TOD principles and the proximity requirements. It supports that investment in light rail infrastructure and proximity to the mix of uses. It provides an opportunity for more attainable rents, whether they be residential or commercial uses that benefit from being in proximity to light rail. It also allows the property owner the ability to develop or sell the full site with the unified zoning pattern. Um, I'll go ahead and skip down. Development of the site supports the following 2040 comp plan goals. This is fairly consistent with what we see on other 2040 plans. It's the 10 minute neighborhood, transit development housing opportunities, safe and equitable mobility, and healthy, safe, and active communities. I just want to close by saying, in the 2040 plan, one of the underlying goals is all parts of Charlotte are part of our future growth. And so we just want to identify that as we made that transition and decision mm -hmm. to zone part of the property as 2019 to TODCC, we would just like to carry it out and continue it on the rest of the site. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, close. Any comments, questions? Second. Um, I do have questions uh, for uh, staff. Um, the, you know, we had a, we talked about this in the earlier um, agenda um, meeting. Um, petitioners just said the, that they would, are willing or they are removing the uh, parcels to the south of Westinghouse Boulevard. Are those the parcels that our staff is concerned that are inappropriate? Um, are there other parts of the parcels that staff is concerned about? I think there's just a general concern about the manufacturing logistics uh, that are ongoing on the site and not understanding what some of those transitions will be, uh, particularly along Westinghouse. I think if there's a removal of the piece on the south side of Westinghouse, it's something for us to go back and, and talk through and consider. And uh, you know, I think a, a better frame of reference or a, a better position from staff would be that it didn't align with some of the policy uh, directives for this particular area, especially when you have such a large uh, space of manufacturing logistics place type. That's, you know, was something that we looked at and say, okay, this isn't innovation mixed use where we expect transition. This is still an area where we see in, uh, industry as a viable place type. So we had more just like said general concerns about policy implementation versus whether or not TOD, if approved, would be uh, a, a, an undesirable outcome. I don't think we would go as far as to say that. I think just generally we felt a little policy challenged uh, on this one and a, probably a better recommendation would be that it doesn't align generally with policy in the larger place type for uh, this large area along Westinghouse, particularly when you've got a pretty large industrial use just to the west. Uh, but overall, you know, if it went to TOD, I don't think we would, uh, you know, have any significant concerns about development outcomes. It's, again, just more of a, a policy issue for us. I, I, I thought the policy, the, the concern was the transition to the west um, in relation to the quarry. And, that's that's one, and I think the the context of it being along Crafters Lane with some industrial uses on the front. I know they're not heavy industrial uses, but looking at the the map that's in front of me here, it seems like there's you know still some of that transition that hasn't quite occurred yet that we've seen in some other areas with adaptive reuse. But uh, you know certainly the market is is better understood by the folks that are getting you know the the inquiries about it. Uh, but for us, you know, I think we just felt a little a little policy short uh, outside of. You know, that I, I think generally if it went to TOD, I don't think we would have any real significant concerns if council wanted to approve or zoning committee made a different recommendation or if we reevaluate it uh, between now and zoning committee and, and had some different thoughts on it. I, I, I kind of hear that, but you know, I, I get, get very challenged because staff's recommendations obviously hold a lot of weight. And as you see as many, some decisions that were made um, here this evening, and, and it seems kind of confusing um, when you're making um, a con contiguous parcel that is a quarter mile away from a light rail station that is close to jobs, jobs um, that are, uh, you know, provide um, incomes like 
the, the, there are many different, there's the Lance factory over there, there's uh, uh, landscaping um, um, uh, companies over there, trucking companies, um, as well as a school in walking distance. This would be optimal place for somebody who didn't, couldn't afford a car or didn't want to have a car to live far away from the center city, but have access to the city as a whole. So when we say that we are policy challenged on putting TOD district here, but then say we wouldn't be upset if council did it, I'm very concerned about what kind of message are we actually putting out there? Like, and I, again, just to clarify, I don't, I don't think from our standpoint, if we didn't have it, if we had an opportunity to make a recommendation that simply said this aligns or doesn't align with the policy, we would simply say it doesn't align with the policy. Uh, that would certainly be, I think, a, a preferred route for some of these challenging petitions where we see that policy is X, request is Y, we see additional you know, justification for some of these in other contexts. But if you zoom out further than this map, this from Westinghouse well over to, uh, you know, I just lost my map on here. Over basically at I-77 and beyond is nothing but purple manufacturing logistics. So I think that's where we didn't quite see whether or not this was an area that was ready for transition from a policy standpoint. And our recommendations are really just limited to does, do not approve, do not approve in current form or recommend approval. We don't really have anything related to how well this does or doesn't align generally with policy outside of that. So you know, I think we're a little bit limited in using some archaic recommendation standards versus where we need to be, which is something that we're going to continue to work on. But I understand the frustration from your side. We have some similar frustrations on our side. Thank you. We have a motion to close the public hearing. So move. Second. Second. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none. All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Seeing none, we'll move on. Thank you. We'll move on to item number 37, rezoning petition 2022-094 by CCC Uptown Gardens, LLC, here of uh, Chaucer Creek Capital, LLC. Approximately 3.59 acres bound by the north side of North Graham Street, the south side of North Smith Street, the east side of West, west 7th Street, and the west side of West 8th Street in Council District 2, Mr. Graham's district. The current zoning is UR2, HD, urban residential, historic district overlay, and the proposed zoning is UMUD HD, uptown mixed use district with a historic uh, district overlay. Staff recommends approval of this petition. Um, there is opposition uh, to this. So after um, presentation, the petition will have 10 minutes. All right, thank you, 2022-094. It's uh, currently zoned UR2 HD and proposed zoning is for UMUD HD. That HD is a historic district that's established in uh, this section of Uptown. Uh, the adopted place type is for neighborhood two. You can see both that as well as regional activity center and community activity center uh, surrounding parts of the site. Uh, Staff does recommend approval of this petition. It is conventional. Uh, overall, you know, inconsistent with neighborhood two because Yuma does allow some intense, uh, more intense development, but part of the uh, analysis that was looked at was the historic district does have uh, some leverage over development outcomes and, and how they align with the overall historic district goals. Uh, so again, staff felt that that was a, another kind of uh, element of how the development would be further, uh, you know, kind of built in and integrated into uh, the historic district uptown. Again, we do recommend approval. It is conventional, so no outstanding issues, no site plan. Uh, we'll be happy to take questions following presentations by uh, the petitioner and the public. Thank you. Good evening again, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council, members of the Zoning Committee, Keith McVeigh with Moore Van Allen assisting Chaucer Creek Capital. Edmund Wadil with Chaucer Creek Capital is here with me tonight and is available to answer questions. Uh, as Dave mentioned, uh, just over a three acre site, it's a, a block surrounded by uh, 7th, 8th, 7th and 8th Street as well as North Graham and, um, and then the street to the back, uh, which I'm not gonna remember. We did have very good meetings with the Springfield, where Springfield Square Condominium which are the condominiums directly across the street 
across Graham Street from the site, and we also attended the Friends of Fourth Ward meeting uh, last Monday night. Uh, they are they understand the request and they were not opposed to the petition. Uh, we also have had conversations with or responded to emails or have reached out to Fourth Ward Square condos, which are the condominiums to our uh, north along A Street, had not heard back from them regarding our offers to meet and review the site. Uh, the site is within a half mile of the existing Blue Line at 7th Station, uh, Lynx Blue Line Station at 7th Street, and within a quarter mile or quarter mile of the Gold Line Station along, along Trade Street, and in very close proximity also as well to the future Gateway Station. Uh, we are in the historic district, as Jay mentioned, and the change in the zoning to mud, UMUD, which will also translate to urban core uh, with the UDO translation in June. Uh, we'll also remain in the historic district. We also are in very close proximity to two of the planned stations for the Silver Line, and the Silver Line alignment actually will run right behind this site. Uh, as Dave mentioned, uh, UR2 to HD to MUD CD. The, the UR2 translation will translate to N2B in June. That is a very suburban multifamily zoning category, and we did not feel, and, and I believe the staff agrees, is really an appropriate zoning district for this type of site in the core of downtown. It would limit the redevelopment of this site to a very similar type of development than what's there, which is typically three to four story surface park apartments with a maximum height of 48 feet. We believe the urban core district with its newer design standards that replace the Yuma district is really the appropriate zoning for this site that will allow the redevelopment of the site with both residential and non-residential uses that support the uptown area as well as the Fourth Ward neighborhood. And the Fourth Ward neighborhood is very aware that the HD has design guidelines that will dictate how the building addresses the street and in compliance with the historic district. Now, their regulations have limits, just like all regulations, but they do have ability to regulate how the, the look of the building. The Friends of Fourth Ward stress the importance of using brick to match the Fourth Ward, and now that's something HDC would could could weigh in on. As Dave mentioned, from a 2040 place type map, we are surrounded on three sides, or approximately three sides, by regional activity center. We are not in the core of Fourth Ward, uh, so it does make sense for these parcels that are actually on the west side of North Graham and separated by Graham from the core of Fourth Ward to, uh, and in close proximity to transit service, and also have other intense, more intense zoning surrounding it that it makes more sense to go from UR2 to UMUD or Urban Core Zoning District. Uh, this is an image of the Uptown Garden. It's 120 units developed in 1985. These are some precedent images we shared with the folks that we met with. Uh, there are no immediate plans by Chaucer Creek to develop this site, but we would envision a mixed-use building, six to seven stories, maybe as high as 12 stories. This is 500 West Trade, a couple blocks away would be appropriate. It could also be more non-residential in nature as allowed <coughs> by, the, by the proposed zoning district. And then some additional images of potential development scenarios. We're happy to answer questions. We also did discuss this uh, petition with Councilmember Graham. I know he's not here in the, at, at the dais, but we have met with Councilmember Graham and he's aware of the request and was supportive of the, of the, of the, of the proposal. Thank you very much. Um, Bradley Diltz, uh, you have 10 minutes once you make your way to the lectern. Good evening, Council, uh, Mayor, Pro Tem, Council members, Zoning Committee, Planning Staff, and City Staff. This may be another first for tonight, but I'm here against this conventional rezoning request. Due to the height allowed in the UMUD HD exceeds the height of what can be reviewed by the Charlotte Historic District Commission. Their rules only allow for review from three to five stories. You may think this is a very specific item, 
Well, another recent approved conventional rezoning request, 2021-180 by Daniel Corp, which is basically diagonal from this proposed uh, project, um, is currently in review by the HDC. And this came up as one of a lot of discussion as to what they could or could not review. It was decided they could only go up to the fifth floor. The building proposed is almost eight stories. Um, there's still lots of other questions um, that the HEC is still having discussions with this proposed uh, development, like materials, and different ones can be used on up to five, and then they can use different ones above it. So it's real inconsistent. And I think that's mainly because that property was up zoned to what this property will be up zoned as well. Um, the HCC only has six months to review once the application begins the review process, getting input from D NCDOT as to things like corner cut of their building, um, street parking on Graham, widening Graham four feet, uh, moving their building back. So it's, it really leads to this whole um, confusion on, on the HDC part in their review of this process and the building standards that will be built. Um, I talked to uh, Mr. McVeigh today and I understand the difficulty of creating a conditional plan uh, when there's no real design in the works. And, but, I ba but I feel based on my experience with the conditional zoning sorry, the conventional zoning that was done for 2021-180, that it's not, it doesn't allow for the review that needs to happen um, before it gets to the decisions of the development haven't been done to where the HDC just has to look at materials and the design and everything else that they really have purview to. Um, <clears throat> you know, the homeowners that are next to the 2021-180, which one of my friends lives there, so that's kind of why I'm kind of more um, involved with this, um, kind of relied on the conventional submission um, or relied on the HDC with that conventional submission that would help, you know, guide a better product, but we're now seeing that uh, the building will be 50 feet higher than their building, which is only 30 feet high and less than 25 feet away from them. Uh, they'll be losing trees as well as parking behind their house, which granted is not on their property, but still impacts them. Uh, while nothing at this point can be done with the 2021-180 petition, this petition can be reviewed and or future positions that or that are in the historic district commission um, can be requested as more of a conditional request than a conventional request um, i'm not sure how much of agreements can be made on a conventional request uh, such as just making sure that the entire building can be reviewed by the hdc so that we have one unified product and that things like NCDOT problems are already resolved before they actually have to hit the HDC for their review. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McVeigh. You have two minutes for your rebuttal. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. As Mr. Dilks did mention, we did discuss the request this afternoon. Uh, I, I, one, one distinction between this site and the, and the site he mentions, which is here, is that that site is under the current UMUD regulations and the HDC regulations. The redevelopment of this site will, will be under the new UDO and the urban core district design standards, which are a greater, a, a new replacement for UMUD design standards, and we believe that coupled with the HDC guidelines will help ensure that the development of this site fits in with the fourth ward neighborhood. 
it would be unusual to create a condition for this site that gives the HDC more authority than it has over any other site in the Fourth Ward neighborhood. I under, we understand Mr. Dilk's concern about what the HDC's ability to review are. We don't have a good solution for that. Um, where was I going with this? I, I would mention that we would have to adhere to streetscape plans, the approved streetscape map, uh, streets map as well. We would work and comply with all those regulations whenever the site is redeveloped. Uh, we would also uh, have to go through land development approval process to address the questions of on-street parking and parking, and, and the city would not uh, issue a permit until those issues were resolved. It would also be very unusual for a conditional plan to be developed to the level of detail that the HDC could weigh in during the rezoning process. Typically, that review by HDC is done after the, con after the rezoning process is completed, whether it's conventional or conditional, because at that point, the developer of the site can provide the level of detail that HDC needs to review and approve. Happy to answer additional questions. Thank you very much. Uh, does council have any questions or comments? <clears throat> Motion to close. Second. Uh, there's a motion that's been made and probably second to close public hearing. Any comments? Hear none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, all opposed, raise your hand. Seeing none, we move on. Thank you very much. We move on to agenda item number 38, rezoning petition 2022-095 by AHC funds. It's located on approximately 0.92 acres. Uh, located on the east side of West 30th Street north, and north of North Tryon Street and west of West 31st Street in Council District 1, Ms. Sanderson's District. The current zoning is I-2 General Industrial and the proposed zoning is TODNC Transit Oriented Development Neighborhood Center. Staff recommends approval of this petition. Uh, there are no um, uh, speakers in opposition. So when Mr. Patton is done, uh, Ms. Grant will have three minutes. Thank you. 2022-095 uh, is on West 30th Street off of North Tryons, currently zoned uh, I-2, General Industrial, and proposed zoning is for TODNC. The adopted place type is for the innovation mixed use. And as mentioned, staff does recommend approval of this petition. It is conventional in nature. It is consistent with the policy map recommendation for the innovation mixed use place type. And we'll be happy to take any questions you might have following Ms. Grant's presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Grant. Good evening, members of council. Bridget Grant, land use consultant with Moore and Van Allen. Following Dave's footsteps, I'm not going to give a presentation. It's consistent. We have staff support. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any uh, close. Second. second. There's a motion that's been made, probably second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed? Seeing none, we will. Motion is unanimous to close public hearing. Moving on to item 39, rezoning petition 2022-097 by OMB Property Holdings, LLC, located on approximately 3.24 acres, located on the northwest side of Yancey Road, east of South Tryon Street, and west of Old Pineville Road, in Council District 3, Miss Watlington's District. The current zoning is I1TS-O, light industrial transit supportive overlay, uh, and the proposed zoning is TODNC, Transit Oriented Development Neighborhood Center. Staff recommends approval of this petition there are no speakers in opposition. After Mr. Patton's presentation, Ms. Ms. Grant will have three minutes. Uh, thank you. 2022-097 uh, is on Yancey Road. It's the uh, old Mecklenburg Brewery site uh, that most of us are likely familiar with. Uh, current zoning is I-2 uh, with transit supportive overlay or transit supportive optional uh, on the site. The proposed zoning is to take that into TODNC. You can see lots of TODNC uh, surrounding this. We've had several recent rezoning petitions to uh, make those transitions to that zoning district. Uh, and this would continue that trend. 2040 policy map does recommend the community activity center place type, so it is consistent with that recommendation. Staff does recommend approval. It's conventional, so no outstanding issues, no site plan, and we'll be happy to take any questions you may have following petitioner's presentation. Thank you. Ms. Grant. Again, Bridget Grant with Morin Van Allen. Pleased to help you get through the rest of this agenda tonight. I will withhold a presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Motion to close the public hearing. Um, uh, any discussion on that motion that's been made probably second? Hearing none, all in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed, say aye, no. Uh, that motion is unanimous to 
Uh, close the public hearing. Moving on to agenda item number 40, rezoning petition 2022-100 by Copper Builders LLC, located on approximately 0.5 acres on the south side of Verbena Street, west of Nations Crossing Road, and east of South Tryon Street in Council District 3, Miss Wallington's district. The current zoning is I-2 General Industrial, and the proposed zoning is TODTR, Transit Oriented Development Transition. Staff recommends approval of this petition. There are no speakers um, in opposition after Mr. Petten's uh, presentation. Uh, Tim Pratt and uh, Luke Hanna will have three minutes. All right, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem 2022 100. Mention is on Verbena Street. Uh, it's currently zoned industrial I 2. Uh, proposed zoning would be TODTR. You can see that uh, existing along a lot of the adjacent parcels uh, just to the west and south of this site. The adopted place type is for activity center as well. So this petition request would be consistent with that 2040 policy map recommendation. Staff does recommend approval. Again, a conventional petition, so no outstanding issues, no site plan. And we'll be happy to take any questions uh, following any. Uh, information shared by the petitioner. Thank you. Are you Luke Hanna or Tim? Excuse me? Are you Luke Hanna or Tim Pratt? I am not. Um, I signed up. I have oh. been. Oh, yeah, you're right. I'm a Stephanie substitute. Holland. I'm Stephanie Holland. I'm with V3. Um, I am happy to answer any questions, but do not have a presentation. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions from this? Um, move to close the public hearing. So Second. moved. The motion is made properly. Second. Any discussion? Here and none. All in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Uh, any opposed? That motion passes. Thank you. We move or uh, move to item 41. Um, and just to let folks know, we only have four council members at the dais. Uh, the way our rules work, once you're here, unless you're excused or, or uh, uh, your, your quorum sticks, and you are automatic yes if you don't vote. Move to reduce taxes. <laughs> Uh, you have to have also unanimous consent from the council members to add something to uh, a, an agenda. So, um, rezoning petition, agenda item number 41, rezoning petition 2022 101 by the Dilweg Companies, uh, located on approximately 4.94 acres, located along the southwest side of 77 Center Drive east of Interstate 77 and north of Tyvola Road in Council District 3, Miss Watlington's District. The current zoning is I-2 General Industrial and the proposed zoning is O-2 Office. Staff recommends approval of this petition. There are no speakers in opposition, um, so uh, the, the petitioner will have three minutes after Mr. Patton. Please. All right, thank you. 2022-101, uh, it's just under five acres off 77 Center Drive adjacent to Interstate 77, it is currently zoned I-2. The proposed zoning is for O-2 conventional. You see we have some O-2 just uh, adjacent, kind of catty corner from this site. Adopted place type is uh, campus for, or, excuse me, from the 2040 policy map. So this petition would be considered consistent with that recommendation for a campus place type. It's a uh, conventional petition. Staff does recommend approval. So again, no outstanding issues, no site plan. Uh, happy to take any questions following any information shared by the petitioner. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Grant, you have three minutes. We're pleased to say that we're consistent with the adopted land use policy and have staff support, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions or comments from the council? We'll close. Close. Second. A motion has been made properly. Second. Any discussion on that? Here or none. All in favor, say yeah, please staff. raise your hand. Any opposed? Uh, that is uh, unanimous. We will move on uh, to agenda item number 42. Um, uh, 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 rezoning petition 2022-102 by Pettit Phillip, LLC. Um, approximately 0.47 acres uh, located at the southeast intersection of Park Road and Reese Road, north of East Woodlawn Road and Council District 6, Mr. Bakari's District. Uh, current zone is B2CD General Business and the proposed zone is B1 Neighborhood Business. Staff recommends approval of the, this petition. There are no speakers in opposition. After uh, Mr. Petten's uh, presentation, Mr. Brown, you have three minutes. Thank you, 2022-102 is off Park Road and Reese Road. That's uh, a little under a half acre. Uh, it is the site of the old uh, Park Road Cleaners. It's just on the back end of Park Road Shopping Center. Uh, rezo or, excuse me, current zoning is B2 conditional. Proposed zoning is to uh, go down to a B1 conventional. Adopted place type on this uh, location is for Community Activity Center. Petition would be considered inconsistent with that. However, uh, there are some overlap in uses from uh, the B1 district and the commercial district to the activity center um, and also the size and, and kind of site constraints that would be on this um, particular location gave staff a little more comfort that this was a, a conventional B1. Uh, there's some background, I think, also to um, the uh, acquisition of the site and some of the old zoning, conditional zoning that was on it uh, was a little 
a little confusing in, in how it was uh, carried out uh, and how it would transition once the cleaner closed. So trying to, to work with all parties to get, uh, get that squared away and, and allow the uh, project and the business to move forward. So again, it is a conventional petition. Uh, staff does recommend approval, no outstanding issues, no site plan. Uh, we'll be happy to take any questions following any information shared by the petitioner. Thank you. Brown, you have three minutes. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, very quickly, uh, as Dave uh, mentioned, uh, the, the petitioner in this uh, case is Petit Philippe. Petit Philippe is the proprietor of a uh, retail wine business. This is a conventional zoning, so I will not go into the specific uses on the site, but I will say the current zoning would not allow a retail uh, wine user on the site. This is a look at the abandoned cleaners on the property. As Dave mentioned, there's a unique conditional zoning Current zoning on the site allows a dry cleaner only. The only thing that can happen on the site is dry cleaning, and it contained this note that said if the dry cleaner ever ceases to, uh, ceases to be a dry cleaner, the proper the owner shall initiate a rezoning to return the zoning classification to B1. Uh, that is what we are seeking to do. Um, we feel that it's consistent with the Community Activity Center. Uh, happy to take any questions. Uh. Are you to Sorry. No, no. Okay. Mr. Mr. Mitchell. Oh, Tim, Colin, just one question, one important question. Mm. If it sees, and a lot of times we have dry cleaning, there's a re remediation that uh, we would like for it to occur, so it would be more uh, attractive for another B1 rezoning, so would, would they be responsible the, for the The property owner, Petit Philippe, happens to already own the property, and they are fully engaged with the state on remediation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Bukhari. I was just going to say, uh, Petit Philippe, or as we refer to it in America, Small Philip translation. Great, amazing uh, small business owners in town. Um, they have managed their way through the pandemic and uh, they've had a lot of challenges. So uh, really applaud the fact that um, they're continuing their growth and expansion. And we're all big fans and love seeing small business uh, in, in my district and all of our districts uh, succeed. So looking forward to tracking this over the next month and hopefully having a speedy approval. Motion close public hearing. Second. So so uh, any discussion on that motion? Hearing none. All in favor, close public hearing. Raise your hand. Thank you. Any opposed? Seeing none. We move on to um, item number 43. Rezoning petition 2022-122 by Cohab Development LLC DBA spacecraft located on approximately 2.4 acres on the north side of North Davidson Street, east of East 26th Street and south of North Brevard Street in Council District 1, Ms. Anderson's District. The current zoning is TODNC, Transit Oriented Development Neighborhood Center, and the proposed zoning is TODUC, Transit Oriented Development Urban Center. Staff recommends approval of this petition. Um, Mr. Patton, you have uh, three minutes, and I don't have any speakers um, for or against. Oh, there you Hi. go. I get. Thank you. you have three minutes after. All right, yep, we'll be quick. 2022, 122, uh, it's on North Davidson Street. It's about two and a half acres, um, very close proximity uh, to the station area. It's uh, just uh, north, south, excuse, excuse me, south of North Brevard Street. Uh, current, current zoning is TODNC, proposed zoning is TODUC. You can see we've got some of that uh, UC district just adjacent to this piece uh, and within close proximity. Adopted place type is community activity center. So the request would be, uh, actually I think we deem this one to be generally inconsistent. It's, it's consistent with an overall activity center, but the UC district does allow some intensities that are uh, a little bit different than just the community activity center. Doesn't create a great deal of concern for staff, but the UC district better aligns with the regional activity center uh, and so that uh, that's the only real uh, inconsistency there is that it would go from that community activity center to regional but again doesn't give uh, staff any significant concerns uh, with that and like I said it's conventional so no uh, outstanding issues no site plan and we'll take any questions following any information shared from the petitioner thank you Hi. Holland you have three minutes sure thank you I uh, don't have a presentation but I can happily answer questions are there any questions what? move to close she has no questions. Right. She doesn't have second. 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 Uh, motion's been made and probably second to close the public hearing. Any uh, questions or comments on that? All in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed? Please raise your hand. See none. As unanimous, we'll move on to item 44, um, which is the last um, 
hearing of the night. Agenda item number 44, rezoning petition 2022-127 by AHC funds on approximately 1.88 acres located on the east side of West 32nd Street, and north of North Tryon Street, and west of Otondo Avenue, and Council District 1, Ms. Anderson's District. The, count, the current zoning is I-2 General Industrial, and proposed zoning is TODNC Transit Oriented Development Neighborhood Center. Staff recommends approval of this petition. Um, and Ms. Patton, you have three, oh, you have as much time as you want, and then Ms. Grant, you'll have three minutes after. All right, we'll be brief on our side. It's uh, our last petition of the evening is 2022-127, currently zoned I-2. Proposed zoning is TODNC, adopted uh, uh, place type for this one is also manufacturing logistics. We've got activity center across the street uh, on the North Tryon side and then innovation mixed juice uh, just on the other side of West 32nd Street. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition. It is inconsistent uh, with that manufacturing logistics. We had some conversations about that earlier. The thing we look at outside of just that when we have an inconsistency is also context and acti development activity in the area. Uh, this one gave us a little bit less uh, concern or consternation than, than uh, ones previously looked at this evening. Uh, so we are recommending approval based off of, of those conversations. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions following any information shared by the petitioner, but it is, again, a conventional uh, petition, no outstanding issues uh, and no site plan associated with it. Thank you. That's great, you have three minutes. Thanks, Dave. Mayor Pro Tem, members of council, I'm happy to close out the night. We appreciate staff support on this and the recognition that this is consistent with what's happening in the development area. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Motion to close. Motion to close. Bridget, you all right with me? Motion and <laughs> made it properly second. Any discussion on that motion here or none? All in favor? Raise your hand. Any opposed? That is unanimous to close. Oh, uh, unless we have uh, a, a uh, dissent, we are adjourned. Topics. Yeah. Council topics, sir. <laughs> Bring that back if you want. <laughs> I'm unanimous, though.